Good evening. I will call the May 16th, 2024 meeting of the Planning Commission of the City of Santa Cruz to order. Could we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Dan? Here. Gordon? Here. Kennedy? Here. McKelvey? Here. Paul Hamas? Here. Thompson? Here. Chair Conway? Here. And do we have any statements of disqualification this evening? Okay, um, seeing none, we will move on to oral communications. This is the time in the agenda when members of the public are invited to address the Planning Commission on items that are not on tonight's agenda, but that are under our purview. Um, would any members of the public care to um, it address the commission tonight? Please come forward. If you would please uh, state your name and um, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, I'm Jill Wynn. At the last Planning Commission meeting, I asked to be notified when public safety and project oversight is placed on the Planning Commission agenda. In response to my request, the Planning Director presented information related to asbestos regulators. The information presented April 18th by the Planning Director was incorrect was not available to me or to the public in general, and the topic was not on the agenda for public comment. This was a violation of the Brown Act and another instance of the planning department overlooking facts and public concerns for the sake of expediency. Today's topic is the public safety merits of posted construction hours. Here are the three comments I submitted to both planning and the building department during construction on Hugus. Number one, what I'm asking for here is a request to the general contractors to post work hours. There are two construction sites on Hugus and one vacant house. Number two, there is now documented report of suspicious activity on Hugus. Making it more difficult for me or my neighbors to call the police is not in the best interest of, con of the contractors or public safety. Number three, Perhaps neighborhood construction, activity density, and construction hours are something that should be considered in the objective standards review. For example, here on Hugus, the garbage truck cannot access the street if vehicles are parked on both sides of the street. Commissioners, instead of construction hours being posted, the refuse truck backed into two cars one early morning during an all-hands construction meeting on Hugus. Instead of construction hours being posted, the worker with multiple arrests for violent crimes who slept in his truck in front of my home returned on multiple weekends to damage my property. And other workers used headlamps, lanterns, and flashlights to begin work before dawn on multiple occasions. When the police were called, they asked if there were posted construction hours. When criminal activity and rule violations are basically dismissed, by the city for the sake of expediency, this emboldens more bad behavior and criminal activity. Please let me know when public safety and project oversight will be on the commission's agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. And we will ask the department to please notify when we have those items on the, on the commission's agenda. Um, would anybody else uh, like to address the commission during public comment? Seeing none, we will move on to approval of minutes. We have minutes from March 7th, 2024 and March or and April 18th, 2024. I move to approve the minutes. Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Next, we will open the consent agenda. Um, we have uh, public hearings on the consent agenda tonight, um, and are there, um, so what we'll do is um, hopefully have uh, a motion to um, move both items on the consent agenda. However, prior to that, um, commissioners do have a chance to ask any questions, and if necessary, we can uh, defer uh, one of the items to a later meeting. Um, do commissioners have any questions? Seeing none, um, no questions from the commission. This is a public hearing. If any members of the public would care to address the commission on one of the items on the consent agenda, now is your opportunity and you're invited to speak. 
Uh, yes. Ms. Marks, do you want to talk on yep. the Ocean Street one? Okay, so this is the opportunity for uh, any members of the public to address the commission uh, on items that are on the consent agenda. So before the presentation. There will not be a presentation. These are on consent. So, but it is a public hearing and we are interested in your comments. And if you'd like to make a comment, please um, introduce yourself and you'll have three minutes. Sure. Hi, my name is Kate Achilles. Um, I'm here to express concerns on behalf of my community regarding the new gym's impact on traffic and safety in the Central Park neighborhood. While we welcome new businesses, we request that you address the traffic flow impacts the gym will have on our residential streets. Without new traffic flow patterns, the increased traffic from the gym will pose serious safety risks. Increased traffic at the intersection of Leonard and May will lead to congestion, noise, and a higher likelihood of accidents. This, inter this intersection is the primary access route into our pocket neighborhood and is a location where many children play and residents walk. To mitigate these risks, we strongly request that the gym traffic be routed to enter via a one-way entrance from Ocean Street which is narrow and should allow for incoming traffic. Additional traffic can enter the gym from May Avenue via Water Street. All traffic should exit the gym from a mandatory left turn from the parking lot onto May Avenue, directing it towards Water Street and preventing it from entering the adjacent residential areas at all. We also propose <clears throat> the inst installation of clear signage indicating local traffic only at the entrances to our neighborhood on Leonard and May and this will discourage through traffic and protect our community's tranquility. Furthermore, we ask for traffic calming measures to be implemented from 300 May Avenue to the intersection of Leonard and May. Specifically, curb extensions with tree plantings should be added at multiple locations, and these measures will not only enhance safety by slowing down vehicles, but will also clearly delineate the beginning of our residential area from the commercial zone. Um, and it's important to note that the intersection of Leonard in May has been a concern even before the gym was proposed. Many drivers speed down May Avenue, often ignoring the stop sign, and that poses a serious danger to our children and pedestrians in the neighborhood. Additionally, we request extending the parking permit program in our neighborhood from 6 to 10 p.m. to minimize any overflow parking from the gym onto our residential streets. And similar traffic mitigation strategies have successfully been implemented in prominent areas around town, including many roads leading into neighborhoods along Mission Street. So we felt like these precedents demonstrate the effectiveness and feasibility of our requests. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your comment. Hi, and I'm uh, Deborah Marks, and I also live in the Central Park neighborhood. And um, just to give you some context, the neighborhood consists of Leonard, May, and Dakota. It's three little streets. It's a very small little neighborhood with little houses, and we're very close to ocean and water. And, uh, and I want to point out that the notice I got and that Kate got, only a few people, residential properties in our neighborhood got that notice. The majority of the notification area was the middle of Ocean Street and the parking lot of the county building. So very, very few people really became aware of this. So we're um, representing our neighborhood because we all have the same concerns in our neighborhood. And um, that's something that should be fixed for, for notifications, that it should really actually notify the people who are impacted. Um, I'm not opposed to a gym going into the location. It might even be a good addition to our neighborhood. However, I am very concerned about the additional traffic that will impact our neighborhood. There's a four-way stop at the corner of Leonard and May, which is already a very dangerous intersection. I contacted Matt Starkey, the traffic engineer, about this problem intersection weeks before we ever got this postcard about the gym. We get Jack in the Box speeding through. We get the medical center speeding through. God knows what comes from the jury room. Um, you know, there's just, you know, my, my husband and I sit in the window and we're um, one from the corner. And we just watch people coming to work and going. And just in that early time of the day, there's people just, they don't stop. They speed down the street. They make a right turn. They, they go around the block because they realize they can't get out. And it's, it's a very dangerous situation there. And um, anyway, so I think that is, that is a very, very big concern. 
I don't think there's a person in my neighborhood who hasn't been terrorized by reckless drivers speeding through the intersection. So with a popular gym next to the intersection open, I think it now might be 24-7. I'm not sure what the hours are. First I heard one thing and then there was something in the newspaper about their opening all their locations. So I don't know what you know, what actually the hours will be. But there's going to be a lot of coming and going. Right now it's a very quiet law office, encompass office. There's not much going on there. This is going to really be a game changer. It's really going to change what's already a an accident waiting to happen. And it's only a matter of time before there's tragedy here. I do want to mention, like Kate mentioned, that there's many children. There's five young children who are like elementary school or middle school age, you know, starting at age four, who live right on that corner. And then in the entire neighborhood, there's just many, many households full of children. Mm -hmm. So um, can I just go a little further? Because there's only two of us. Okay, um, so there's the things that can be done to mitigate the additional traffic that's generated by the gym and just in general is... Um, a bulb outs at the corners um, and left turns e exiting the gym parking lot directing the traffic to May Avenue and a sign saying neighborhood traffic only or local traffic. So we also would like to see our par parking permits extended. This is the same comments. Yeah, same comments here. it is, but I think it's worth saying twice because mm -hmm. those are our concerns mm -hmm. and um, you know we um, I see traffic mitigations all over the city. I, I do home health, and I've done it for years. So I get to drive all over the east side, all over the west side. Um, I'm, you know, I look at the PATH building on Mission, the CVS on Mission, the Garden Center on Mission. They all have similar mitigations to what we're asking for. And those businesses hardly generate any traffic, really. It's not like this. And Ms. Marks, so, I am going to have to ask you, okay. in the interest of fairness, to conclude your remarks. Okay, so I'll conclude, but I hope you can include some of these ideas in the um, conditions of approval for this project. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your service. Um, are there any so, further comments or questions from the commission? And if there, if we have too much, we can certainly defer an item. If, so it, just so I understand procedurally, is this mm -hmm. like if one of us wants to pull it off the agenda, then we'd continue it? I think. I mean, put it onto the agenda from consent onto the agenda, is it? I guess if one of you would like to pull if it off. If one of us would want to do that. Yeah. So that's the first question is, does anyone yes. want to it do doesn't, that? Right? Would, does anybody want to discuss this further? Um, and then we'll have to make a decision about whether we'll do it tonight or defer it. I'm good leaving it on consent. And you're certainly welcome to ask questions. You're, you're, you're not in any way prohibited from that. So if we ask questions, we're not, I mean, um, we're if, pulling if, it if, though, then, <laughs> right? Mr. Butler, could you help us clarify? Sure, thank you. Uh, Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. and. Um, you can ask questions on the consent calendar without actually pulling it. If it gets into a substantial discussion, then I would recommend pulling the item. Um, but if you've got brief questions, um, we've got staff members, our project manager from planning, as well as Matt Starkey, our city transportation engineer, are available. Did you have a question? I guess my question would be what level of study was done in regards to the concerns about the left-hand turn possibilities or keeping the circulation the way it is. I mean, I understand this building has been pretty underutilized mm -hmm. and they're intensifying this use pretty significantly, so. Hi, uh, Matt Starkey, Transportation Manager. Happy to discuss these um, issues. I think the, the short answer is that when we have new developments that don't generate a net change in 50 additional trips, we do not go to the formal traffic study um, route. So there's no um, sort of evaluation that's been substantiated to look at those questions. I think uh, qualitatively though, I think what was outlined, uh, those circulation patterns would be quite challenging um, in regards to access leaving the neighborhood and the site um, because people would have to take a right turn onto Water Street uh, and head away from downtown. Um, and so you wouldn't be able to get back, say you lived on the west side and you wanted to go to that gym. 
So those issues around circulation are not something that um, I would support. There are other issues that were identified. I think um, the parking program, I think that's something for residents to always remember. They are in control of that program. They petition us, the city, to make the changes. So feel free to reach out to me and we can start that process. There is a waiting list for it. Uh, the other uh, issue, I believe, was the traffic calming. Um, I like the, the suggestions. Our challenge is always funding for that um, very oversubscribed program. We recently had a call for projects uh, citywide, and we received 330 requests. Uh, so hopefully these neighbors are on our list, um, and we are going through and evaluating those now, and probably the top five to 10 may actually get implemented from that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So part of the answer is to be sure to um, stay in touch with traffic management, apply for the um, extended parking program, and for traffic calming measures. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Um, with that, I would uh, entertain a motion to um, pass on the consent agenda. I'll move the items on consent agenda. I'll second. Is there any more discussion? Could we have a roll call vote on the consent agenda, please? Commissioner Dan? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Paul Hamas? Yes. McKelvey? Yes. Thompson? Yes. <laughs> yes. Chair, Chair Conway? Yes. Thank you. OK. Um, with that, um, we will move on to our, um, oh, actually, we also have an information item that we should address briefly, which is the 2023 Annual Housing Element and General Plan Progress Report. Hi, good evening, Chair, Vice Chair, and Commissioners. I'm Matt Benoit. I'm Principal Planner for our Advanced Planning Division. I uh, just wanted to give you a, a brief overview. We, we sent a memo to, to you all in the packet. Uh, this item was presented to council ahead of the April 1st due date for uh, the state to require our submittal of the annual progress report for the housing element and general plan. We typically come back at some point to planning commission to discuss that further, answer any questions. Uh, given the agenda today, uh, we're either happy to move this item to another date, but. Uh, uh, we have a, our senior planner, Clara Stanger, here, as well as me. You can reach out to us anytime as well instead, and we're also happy to answer your questions offline, too. So whichever the commission chooses, that, that's our recommendation for tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to um, invite any members of the public who are interested in the city's progress on meeting its housing goals to take a look at this item. I think, I think it's pretty readable, but, uh, um, and congratulations. Um, it's a great report. Um, and we are not required to take any action except for to accept the report. Um, we can ask for to place it on a further agenda if anybody wants to, but um, otherwise it is strictly an informational item. So with that, requiring... Aside from mm -hmm. celebrating our housing successes one more time, uh, oh, I don't okay. think it's worth uh, kind of bringing it back to us, but thanks and good work. Yes. Would any other commissioners like to comment on, on this item? Great job. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, and I want to take this moment to... Those great jobs go to Clara. Right. She was really incredible in putting this together very quickly for meeting all the various state requirements, especially new ones this year. So thank you, Clara. Yep. Yeah, thank you. It really was very readable, and those timelines are not easy. <laughs> Any other comments? Oh, yes, Mr. Butler. Thanks, Chair Conway. Um, I would just uh, take the opportunity to reiterate, as you all know, but it's, it's worth, uh, as Commissioner Kennedy was saying, celebrating our successes, uh, reiterating that um, when we turned in this uh, latest annual housing element, we had met our state housing, our regional housing needs allocation uh, targets in every income category, which is something that only about 6% of the state was able to achieve. And so that has 
a number of benefits for us, not the least of which is we've got a lot of affordable housing in our community because of the good work that um, we as, as a city have done in partnership with uh, the development community and nonprofit developers and um, commissioners like yourselves and the city council, all who uh, play an important role in uh, making sure that this housing gets built. Great. And for-profit developers? Yes, yes, yeah, the development community is yeah, yeah. intended to also include I, both sure for-profit and sure. non-profit developers. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, we will move on to tonight's public hearing. Um, we will be considering um, 1130 and 1132 Mission Street, project number CP23-0103. This project has been returned to the Planning Commission at the direction of the City Council at their April 30th, 2024 meeting. Uh, tonight, the Planning Commission will review revised plans submitted following the January 18th Planning Commission approval and subsequent appeals to the development proposal at 1130 Mission Street. And we will provide a recommendation on the applicant's proposed changes and it will return to the council meeting on May 28th, 2024. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Butler. Thank you, Chair Conway. Um, <clears throat> I would like to take this opportunity to set the context a little bit before um, turning it over to Senior Planner Ryan Bain, who's the project manager on this. Um, we've received a lot of comments on this project. Um, concerns about height and massing and parking and traffic affordability levels. Um, those are very understandable and common concerns that we hear when uh, new development is proposed. And um, I wanted to sort of set the stage and talk a little bit about some of the state regulatory changes. Um, many of you are familiar with those, um, and I think members of the community are becoming more familiar with those as more and more projects come through. But I think it also um, is, is just an opportunity to reiterate how the, the playing field has really changed. So, um, Ryan, um, Tess, can we get the presentation? Great. All right. Thank you, Ryan um, and Tess. Um, so, um, most of us are aware of the housing issues that we have here in the city. Um, this is a, a survey from a few years back where high cost of living was the highest ranked um, issue um, and not enough housing for people who work here uh, was the, the next highest ranked very serious issue in the city. And next slide, please. Um, that has continued. This is a 2024 uh, survey that the city did, and affordable housing was the, the top-ranked issue. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, what I want to talk about a bit is the issue of housing production actually making all housing more affordable. And when you look at this, slide there's a lot of words up there um, but when when you look at the questions uh, most people get the economic questions accurate when you're talking about increasing the number of a certain commodity and that having a corresponding decrease in um, the the cost of that product um, but that is not the case when it comes to housing. This national survey actually showed that most people get that question wrong. Um, and um, that's, that's because you know, new housing is often costly um, because it's new. Um, but time and time again, the, the facts bear out that new housing production at all levels actually decreases the rate at which housing costs would otherwise increase. So if you go to the next slide, please, Ryan. Um, here is some data from a, a number of cities, and you can see the housing production on the left and the change in median rent on the right happens to correspond 
in the exact opposite order. The more housing that is produced, the less steep the rent increases are. Go to the next slide, please. Similarly, we've got <coughs> other studies, other cities showing the same thing. Housing production makes it more affordable than would otherwise be the case. And you can see the United States overall as compared to these cities that, that produced substantial numbers of housing units. And the same results happen not just when you're studying US cities, but internationally as well. Next slide, please, Ryan. Um, you can see here that um, in New Zealand, housing production spiked after changes in their um, regulatory environment around 2017 or so. And that's the, the graph on the left. You can see um, Auckland significantly <coughs> increasing housing production. And then if you jump over to the one on the right, that change resulted in a flatter median rent increase. And looking at that middle chart, the gap between housing costs in Auckland and Wellington narrowed substantially. Next slide, please. <clears throat> housing production also correlates to a uh, reduced amount of displacement. And next slide. And the number one factor that is correlated with homelessness is housing costs. Next slide, please. So when we look at California's production of housing over the past four plus decades, we can see this strong downward trend. The next slide shows it even better when you look at these five-year averages. This is the production of housing in California, and these are the reasons why we're in the situation that we're in. And it's not just in California. If you go to the next slide, we see the same thing, this downward trend from 1980. There's an exception in 2021 there. But when you look at that 2010 to 2020 time frame, that's the lowest production that we had in the last 40 years. And that corresponds with the very substantial rent increases that we've seen over the last um, recent years. Next slide, please. So uh, this slide was created by Shane Phillips. Um, if you don't know Shane, he is the author of The Affordable City. He's a professor at UCLA, and um, I would recommend that book. It's a good book. It's got a lot of different policy options and um, a, a short analysis on all of those options for how to address housing affordability. And, and I really like this slide um, because we here in Santa Cruz, I think we would all agree that we have an appealing city. It's a place that is attractive to many people. And um, most folks agree, you see that in our surveys, that we also want an affordable city. And when people are drawn to the city, and when we have uh, a desire for affordability, we cannot have an unchanging city. That place in the middle, it does not exist. You can have a appealing and unchanging city, but it is not going to be affordable. And you can have an appealing and affordable city only if you are changing. And so, Given our demand here, um, reaching a completely affordable city is not realistic. We're not anticipating that that is going to be the case. But housing production over time does make a difference in reducing housing price increases. That can help reduce displacement. For example, if a family's rental unit is sold, that will make it more likely for that family to not only find housing, but be able to afford that housing. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> and affordable housing is best. That's what we strive for. That helps the most, but market rate housing is critical as well. Um, 
we do not have enough subsidies to only produce affordable housing, and we need housing at all income levels to help bring down those costs for all. These are statements from the Legislative Analyst Office from uh, circa 2016, 2017. So these are not new concepts, but they're, they bear repeating because it's, it's something that we are all working towards as a community um, in promoting housing production. Facilitating more private housing helps make housing more affordable for low-income Californians. And market rate housing reduces housing costs for low-income households and helps mitigate displacement. And significant increases in housing construction offer the greatest potential benefits to the most Californians. And so that's really what we're uh, seeking to do with a lot of our projects. Next slide. All right, last slide here. Um, we are. Um, we are looking at um, a, a sea change in how the state has viewed housing production because of that context that um, was just set there. And um, the, the biggest and I would say most substantial change is the strengthening of the Housing Accountability Act, which prevents cities from denying or reducing the number of housing units, the number of units in housing projects. Um, that has changed what we do as city planners and what you all as commissioners and what council members do. It's just totally turned that on its head, um, and it's been very, very impactful. Um, the density bonus. Um, the density bonus a few years ago could go up to a 35% density bonus. Density bonus can now go up to 100% as of January 1 of this year. Um, and this, this particular project is proposing 45%. Um, and then um, elimination of parking minimums. We're familiar with that. Um, that's applicable in this project. Um, affirmatively furthering fair housing. Um, the state mandate to combat housing discrimination and uh, incorporate more housing units into areas of high opportunity where there are better outcomes from uh, educational and financial perspectives. Um, this project is in a high opportunity area and would be introducing additional housing units in that area. Um, this unit, or excuse me, this project also used the SB 330 prelim talking about consistency and streamlining. That allows projects to lock in the regulations that are applicable at the time. So our current objective standards do not apply to this project because the, um, the preliminary review application was submitted prior to those. Um, I was just at the National Planning Conference in, um, in uh, Minneapolis and um, you know, looking at what's happening across the, the nation, we are really fortunate to be in a position where we've got a progressive state that's taking a lot of these steps towards promoting housing production. Um, it's not perfect, but um, they are taking steps in the right direction. And, and speaking of not being perfect, we did make some mistakes on the review of this application. Ryan's going to talk to you about those momentarily. Um, the, uh, the mistakes did not materially affect the project that's being proposed. You know, there were 59 units before. There are still 59 units now. There were requests, that, and the applicant proposed to uh, change some of those units to ADUs. Um, so accessory dwelling units were not included when you saw this last time and some of those units uh, some of those units were converted to accessory dwelling units and then there was a, a one change related to accessory dwelling units subsequent to that um, but um, before turning it over to Ryan I just want to point out that um, you know we're really looking at trying to do what's best for the community as a whole and there are localized impacts when we do this there are traffic impacts, there are parking impacts, and um, the state uh, and, and councils have, and planning commissions have responded to community members. And you know, community members have expressed concerns and council members have said, okay, I hear you. They respond by you know, reducing the number of units, they respond by uh, denying projects, and, and when that happens, um, it's 
not only reducing those units, um, but it's also discouraging other developers, the, the person next door, from deciding that they want to come in and um, invest in, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars when they could otherwise um, you know, continue collecting rent, um, particularly if there's that risk of not having a project that's going to work. So um, I appreciate you, you bearing with me through that because, you know, when that happens uh, through that conversation, because, uh, you know, that the state doesn't allow that anymore. Um, the, the state has stepped in and said, um, we are, we're not going to allow that. Projects need to move forward, and um, we are um, going to continue you know, working on our objective standards. We're going to um, continue to um, do our best in, in reviewing applications, making sure they're complying with those objective standards, and um, we are going to see more projects like this. And these are the types of projects that are not only going to meet our housing goals, but also are going to meet our climate goals. And um, we are going to experience growing pains through this process um, as it, we're transitioning from this more auto-centric um, development pattern to a, uh, a pattern where it's less reliant on the automobile and more reliant on public transit. With that, I'll turn it over to Ryan to talk through the project. Can we ask questions about your presentation yeah, you please. just did? Yeah. So can you go back to the, um, and I actually don't want to belabor this because I want to get to the actual project, but the one of the first slides you had which showed the, that one. Yeah, this one, the one in Minneapolis. There we go. Mm -hmm. The yeah, one before this. If you go back one more. Yeah. And I think that you said in your comments, you know, that because this shows the creation of new housing and rents going down, um, and that I think the previous slide was showing some, some data. And I guess I would like for a future meeting to know, um, if, since it seems like this can be calculated, at what point, how many new units do we need to have before we see rent reductions here? So let's be clear about that. That's a great question. Um, and it's spelled I tried, out right I here. Tried to, I tried to actually weave that in a little bit into the conversation because I, I don't want to um, I, I don't want to sugarcoat this and, and say that we're going to have an affordable city, right? Well, but we I think a, that that's what the data implies that if we build enough housing, we should see rent reductions. And I think we want to manage expectations because I've lived in Santa Cruz for 30 years and I've never seen rent reductions. And even when we've had periods of building housing and we've had a, we're having a lot of housing come online. So, I mean, should we expect rent reductions? And I just heard somebody told me today that the top floors at the Front and Laurel building are going for 6,000 a month. So, so that's so, not a rent reduction. Uh, and neither is the Minneapolis um, uh, right here. If you look at that, these are real terms change in median rent. And so the, the median rent actually went up by, if, if I recall correctly, it went up um, about 2% or so over that time frame. Um, what it is, is without that housing production, it would go up substantially more. And so the housing production means that rents are not going to go up as much as they otherwise would. And so this is real terms change in media. That's rent. really important, though. I think when we make these presentations, we should be clear about that because we're setting expectations that don't worry, public, um, we're going to build enough housing and you'll see rent reduced and we'll have a more affordable city. I, I just think it's important to set realistic expectations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. If, if that wasn't clear, I, I apologize because that, you know, is very important to understand that, you know, we, and, and even in these cities, you know, when you look at this and you go to the next slide, for example, um, which I believe also has Minneapolis on it. Yeah, so there's a small um, increase over that time frame of, um, of 17 to 23. Um, and, you know, that is much less than inflation. Right, and that's why on that other slide it, it appeared negative because it's comparing it to inflation in terms of real real terms. But um, you can see here, 
all of these cities had some level, you know, Minneapolis the least, had some level of um, a rent increase. But you look at the United States overall, that's a 30% increase. And so what we're trying to do is soften that curve, have a slower rent increase, because the rent increases are going to continue, but they're going to they're going to be steeper if and and and, and it'll be less affordable for people if we're not producing housing. Go ahead. So I want to ask you to predict the future. You think in three years that the whatever nine hundred units we just built will will it be measurable? Here in Santa Cruz, I know it's a tiny sample size. I'm thinking of former Commissioner Singleton. He used to kind of jokingly say, well, if we built 10,000 apartments tomorrow, which would have an enormous impact on this city, then we'd be talking about like starting to soften that curve. I don't know if that's true, but, but will we be able to measure it, or is it just too small? Whether we can measure it, I think, um, uh, is challenging. But um, I can say with confidence that the data shows that the rent increases would be even greater because the demand hasn't gone away. The, the folks that are vying for that $6,000 apartment, <clears throat> if that $6,000 apartment isn't there, they're vying for another house here. And that just pushes that competition down to lower levels. So having more supply does affect the overall price of rentals. It would be great in, to have in a data, if possible, next time interest rates drop to zero, because we could use it, you know. And, right. and, and um, put that against how the economy has done over time, because in my experience, when the economy is pumping like it is now, prices across the board go up. When the economy tanks like it did in 2008-9, Prices went down. I mean, that was the first time in the county in 30 years that everything got reassessed. Um, so I just think this is great, um, but there's stuff left out of here too, like looking at the economy and the fact that Santa Cruz is 35 minutes away without traffic from the biggest economic engine in the world, which of course, as we all know, affects everything, housing yeah. prices, rent. Yep, there, there are certainly macroeconomic factors at play that have significant influences, you know, whether it's you know, the Silicon Valley or the university or the attraction of our natural environment. All of these things are creating demand. That demand doesn't go away if we're not building housing. That demand stays there. It's insatiable. That's right. Yeah. But the, the housing production is what is needed in order to mitigate the steep increases you know I, I appreciate the context and and also remembering that housing affordability is an expression of its relationship to um area median income which which, which is built into some of these but it's sort of a faded faded footnote and also along with affordability availability is one of our our big issues, and this definitely addresses those. And I really appreciate the context um, for, from that. So sure. thank you. Thanks for indulging me in that in advance of the discussion. Thank you. I'm Ryan Bain, senior planner. Um, you kind of went over a little bit of the background. Um, so thank you for that um, as, as you had mentioned uh, Planning Commission approved this back on January 18th um, and then there were two separate appeals um, in January of 29th to 24 and following receipt of the appeals and before being scheduled for the City Council hearing um, applicants submitted some revised plans to the Planning Department um, reducing the number of single room occupancy units from 59 to 48 um, amongst other, other changes that um, I'll I'll go over here in, in a little bit. Um, the city also received several items of correspondence from the public identifying areas of concern regarding details on the plan, uh, which triggered additional plan revisions um, from the applicant. So um, at the April 30th city council hearing, um, the council uh, approved a motion referring the application back to the planning commission to write a recommendation on the applicant's proposed changes. Um, and uh, as you had mentioned, um, the appeal on tonight's Planning Commission recommendation will be heard by the City Council on 
on May 28th. So um, some of the revisions that have happened since you last saw this project, um, the base density, pro best base density diagram is the main one that's um, been revised. Um, and as mentioned, there was uh, storage spaces that have been and added that um, for the purpose of adding ADUs under state law uh, for conversion ADUs. Um, also, there's two additional requested concessions um, from the previous uh, application um, that you that you reviewed, and then also um, there's been uh, several uh, new conditions of approval um, that have been um, added to the project. So the base density program uh, diagram. So the applicant has revised um, its G GPO five in the plans, um, which demonstrates the base density calculations um, for the project. Um, as most everyone knows, it's necessary in order to determine the allowed uh, density bonus calculations, which are based on the maximum number of units that would be permitted under the city's zoning code. Um, so in areas like this where there isn't a density range, um, it's it's basically done by doing a diagram that that shows a project that meets all of the development standards for the underlying zoning, and thus establishing the base density. So uh, following the planning commission hearing, it was brought to staff's attention uh, that the base density diagram was inaccurate um, because it did not show the correct rear yard setbacks and did not fall, uh, meet the allowed uh, FAR of 1.75. So um, the community commercial zoning um, district requires a 15 foot rear yard setback as was depicted on those original plans. Um, but the Mission Street Urban Design Overlay District uh, calls for increased setbacks, um, which are 25 feet for the first and second story and 35 feet for the third story, which is demonstrated here on the, the revised and new base density diagram. So this has been corrected. Are these both level twos? I'm sorry? The left is two, right is three. Sorry, yeah, the one on the left is, is level two, and then the one on the right uh, would depict, um, Got it. yeah, three. So, um, so through the course of the revisions, um, the number of density units was reduced from 40 to 33 units, and the FAR was recalculated using the gross lot area instead of the net area, uh, which deducted the riparian setback area. Um, this, there's recent state law, SB 330, that requires the city uses the general plan density for the FAR calculation, which is based on a gross acreage. So. Um, We've included the gross acreage as opposed to previously we had, we had taken out um, and done a net. So that, that changed up the FAR calculation as well. So as is demonstrated uh, in the table, the base density FAR calculation results in a FAR of 1.72, um, thus not exceeding the maximum 1.75 of the base zoning. Um, the prior plan also incorrectly included the covered parking area in FAR calculations. And our zoning code specifically states that um, it's when, when it's residential parking, it's to be included as an FAR. And this is actually commercial parking. So the, uh, the parking area is not included in the FAR. Um, also, part of the base density diagram is um, requirements regarding unit size. Um, so the updated plans include a new page um, that provides details on how the proposed project meets the requirements of average gross unit area, uh, since the zoning code specifies that the average unit area of the proposed project cannot exceed the average unit area in the base density calculation. Um, the zoning code uses the gross residential areas. It's used to determine the floor area and includes the area of the unit walls. So the previous plans approved in January by the Planning Commission did not call out that comparison between the average gross unit area of the base density plan and the average density, a gross unit area of the proposed project. Um, so the latest plan shows that, um, and it shows that it meets the provision where it is uh, equal to, or actually in this case, it's less than um, the base density side. So um, that is being met and is clearly shown on the plans. Um, it should also be noted that there is also an additional page um, that provides 
um, an average net um, unit area. And it might have caused a little confusion because that was specifically provided to show that it's meeting the SRO requirements in terms of the unit area for those because um, that calls out net unit size versus gross. So kind of two apples and oranges here. Um, and so um, with an average net unit size of 287.7 square feet, the diagram demonstrates that the average net SRO unit size falls within the permitted range. Um, also with the revisions to the base density diagram and the number of units, there's also that, that affected the inclusionary requirements. So with a new base density of 33 units um, instead of 40, um, there would be six, 20% would be um, six of the resi residential units would be required to be deed restricted as affordable housing units um, at the very low income level, uh, which is 50% of AMI. Um, so in addition, the applicant intends to convert the newly proposed storage spaces into 11 ADUs. Um, and of the 11 ADUs, two will be required to be restricted at the low income level. That's based on our, our ADU ordinance. Um, however, the property owner has volunteered um, to provide all eight units as at the very low level, consistent with the original proposal that was heard by the Planning Commission. So I'd as I mentioned, the, in terms of revisions to the actual project plans, um, the, the four plans for levels two through five have been revised to replace three units with storage spaces on each floor. Um, additionally, the rear setback along the western property line has been reduced from 15 feet to 6 feet 3 inches uh, in the location of those storage space um, spaces. Um, the setback reduction is proposed to be added to the original waiver request um, for a zero setback. Um, the applicant has indicated that the intent of the added storage space is to take advantage of recent state ADU laws, um, which allows the conversions of the, of the portions of the existing family dwelling structures that are not used as livable space. So um, these sections indicate that a local agency is required to ministerially approve these types of conversions with a building permit. So uh, assuming the project is approved, at the time of the building permit application, the applicants will be proposing to convert the 11 storage spaces into 11 ADUs resulting in a total of 59 units, so 40, 48 SROs and 11 ADUs. Um, also, since um, Planning Commission reviewed this, there are two additional concessions that are being requested by the applicant. Um, and based on the affordability levels, the applicants are entitled up to, up to three concessions. Um, so the purpose, uh, the the first concession is regarding a condition of approval that is a standard condition that we have regarding um, future food service and providing ducting and venting and everything to accommodate you know, a future restaurant or something like that. Um, uh, the applicants requesting this condition be removed, stating that requiring construction of building features that are not necessary for the proposed uses unnecessarily increases costs to the project. This concession would result, would result in identifiable and actual cost reduction to provide for affordable housing costs and is consistent with the state law and, that, and thus must be granted. Um, the second is, refer, is, a, is a request to defer payments of impact fees um, until the time of issuance of a final certificate of occupancy for the development. So a standard condition is that the fees are paid at the time of building permit issuance. Um, and so the, at, the, at the request of the applicant, they want to defer the payments um, and stated that the collection of fees at building permit issuance increases costs to the project because of interest payments on those funds um, during the course of construction. So therefore, grant, the granting of this concession will result in an identifiable and actual cost reduction um, to provide affordable housing costs and, and thus must be granted by state law. I um, understand they must be granted, but those came up since we've seen it or since council saw it, those, those two? Those, those are two requests that came after the Planning Commission approved it. But before the council meeting? 
before yet. Okay, I just wanted to be clear. I know I read it in the report, but I wanted to be clear about yes. that sequence. Gotcha. Um, also, in the in the the course of since the planning commission review, this there's mm -hmm. been um, a lot of discussions with neighbors, with council members, um, and identifying a lot of different issues. Um, and to address a lot of these issues, <laughs> the applicants have been um, working with council members, neighbors, and staff um, to um, volunteer conditions of approval to address a lot of these issues. Um, so I listed all of them here. I don't know if I need to go over all of them, but as you can see, a lot of them have to do with privacy concerns, um, some of the issues regarding um, loading spaces that I know were discussed at the Planning Commission meeting in January, um, uh, providing... Uh, and Mr. Bain, I do think it's worth at least summarizing what these are um, in case everybody didn't see them. You know, maybe not reading them out, but just kind of bullet pointing what these new conditions of approval are, if you would. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, do you want me... You don't want me to read them all together, but just kind of give an overview. Yeah. Um, so, as I mentioned, one had to do with the um, windows facing the creek and issues with um, having having window coverings, um, and basically uh, had to do with lighting and uh, off off lighting off the site that affects neighbors and the creek area. Um, Another has to do with privacy concerns from the roof terraces, uh, as I mentioned, the curbside loading and delivery um, to the site, how to address that um, on the north end of the driveway. Uh, uh, another issue was the impacts of the, of the project on the neighboring single family home and their solar panels. And so um, they volunteered to um, pay the remaining balance of the cost of the solar panels for that adjacent property at 12 Tub Laurel, uh, not to exceed $10,000. Um, there was also some concerns about um, the uses that would be going into the retail space, um, fast food, grab and go, deli counter type things. Um, just clarifying that those are not permitted unless an administrative use permit is, is pulled for that uh, and applied for. Uh, there was some concerns about future building colors, um, about the mural, and um, how that was going to be um, reviewed and, and, and approved as part of the building design. Um, there was also concerns, I know, about parking. And I know this was discussed at Planning Commission as well, about when someone's going to be pulling in there, how they're going to be able to know if there's any parking available and then maneuvering in and out of that space. So there is a condition where they're volunteering um, an electronic sign and system to display available parking spaces within the, within the garage if it is technically feasible. Um, there was also discussions about uh, the city metro, and so they're volunteering the cash cash bond in the amount of $7,500 for the city or metro, which the city or metro may use for future bus stop improvements. Um, and then there was also um, an added condition. This was in conjunction uh, discussions with the county environmental health uh, regarding, regarding soil management um, and, and during um, for potential contaminated, contaminated soil during grading. So that's covering that. Thank you for mm -hmm. summarizing those. I think they're important. So um, in terms of recommendation, we're recommending that the Planning Commission acknowledge that the revisions to the project uh, meet the city and state requirements and recommend that the City Council approve the application based on the findings listed in the resolution and those conditions of approval that are attached as, as part of the resolution. And um, I am available for any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, for starters, uh, we'll, if the commission has any questions of staff, we'll do that, and then we'll move on if, and ask if the uh, developer has a presentation tonight and ask questions of the developer, and then we will ask the appellant if they have repellents, um, if they have a presentation. 
Um, so that, that's the order of our events. So for starters, um, questions from the Commission of Staff. Go ahead, Commissioner McKelvey. Evening, you guys. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with us. Um, my question is about early on in the presentation. So can you explain the process here where we approved it, changes were made, it went to the city council, and they returned it to the commission mm -hmm. without it becoming a new application? Or can you explain how the mechanism for how that works for the, for the audience, if, or, if not for me? <laughs> Sure, happy to, Commissioner McKelvey. So um, this is this application is technically still with the council. Um, uh, the council continued it to from their prior meeting to their May twenty eighth um, meeting. So in the midst of that, they have referred it back to the planning commission for a recommendation. So the first time this project was before the commission you were actually taking an action and um, then that action was appealed. Um, uh, that appeal is still active and uh, it was, there were actually two appeals. Um, so those appeals, I should say, are still active. The council is still going to act on this. Um, what we will be doing is taking the uh, discussion this evening and summarizing it and um, taking the recommendation that we receive from the commission and we'll be forwarding that to the council for their consideration on the 28th. Thank you, that clarifies it. It does. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? Uh, seeing none. Nice close. try, Chair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so in the same vein, I read in the staff report this part about current code, I'll just read it real quick. Uh, in California, projects are allowed to utilize new state laws that came into effect during the review process. Current state law allows a second density bonus of 50%. So if desired, the owner could, could go back through the planning process and create a building that is 86 units. Presumably, that'd be a lot taller building. Is that fair to guess? Presumably, yes. OK. Because I want to just say that again, that uh, this application is smaller than it could be by current laws in that way. That's true. Yeah, Commissioner Gordon. That 86 unit, is that considering CC zoning or the MU-M zoning, uh, if oh, they were to use that? It's in the workbench report. I, it's sort of in there. Mm -hmm. it, it would be a new application if they were doing that, so it would have to uh, adhere to the um, the new regulations. Um, so, in theory, you know, they would they would adhere to those new development standards. Um, I think. Um, as is often the case, you know, there are a lot of ways to make projects work. I, I believe that was used as an example based on the, the current scenario. Um, however, um, you know, there are actually provisions that say um, that uh, in, in state law that say that um, the changes to an application um, that is using an SB 330 prelim are exclusive of density bonus. And so in theory, they could come back and still, uh, and still use that approach. Um, but I, I think it just, um, the, the main point of that is just to demonstrate that um, they've got, I believe, around a 45% density bonus, and um, new state law would authorize up to a 100% density bonus. Presumably, that would be a, a larger building, um, a taller building, and, and more massive. Okay. So. And another question of staff? Commissioner Kennedy? So I want this to be a simple question. Like the part of the the errors are fine. These kind of things happen. The part I felt bad about sitting up here was the Mission Street plan inconsistency with the general plan, because that's like a pretty old plan. Can we update that Mission Street plan, like just that part, without <coughs> cracking that whole thing open? 
like it must be annoying for them printing out these things and getting two or three different, you know, setbacks. That's annoying. But again, like I've done a whole plan. I know what that takes. It's a big deal. It's a lot of work. Thank you for those comments. Um, yes, it is something that we will need to continue to look at. Um, you know, there are state laws that speak to a requirement to um, have the full general plan capacity be able to be realized as part mm -hmm. of a project. And this commission has seen projects where um, projects have come in and deviated from the zoning because they weren't able to accommodate the full general plan capacity. Um, in this instance, the developers were able to, um, uh, to modify the proposal um, and, um, and meet those um, Mission Street standards. Um, that may not be the case in some other um, development application, in which case the, the general plan um, could prevail would prevail and um and we would have to deviate from those um mission street standards but your your point is well taken with respect okay. to um needing to look at that mission street plan and you know as we've updated um other standards there may still be some inconsistencies with the mission street urban design guidelines okay and i believe we caught a lot of that in the objective standards update that's now in effect also but mm -hmm. Okay, that's enough. We, we can take a look at that mm -hmm. and, and verify. That's my question. Okay, thank you. And, uh, Commissioner Gordon, you, oh, sorry, Commissioner Dan, if, if you have a question. Just following up on that, go ahead. So I'm going in a different direction. Okay. Um, so I'm sorry, I do have a couple questions, and because um, this is round two for everyone mm -hmm. except Commissioner Thompson and myself. So um, this, and this isn't really a straightforward project, it's pretty complicated. So I just want to go through a little bit of the history and make sure I have it right. Um, so when this commission heard this project in January, um, that project was for 59 units based on a previous calculation of the base density. That base density has now been revised because it, there was found to be an error. And now the base density plus the 50% density bonus allows 48, 49 units. 48 or 49 units, correct? Yes. So that, 48, yes. 48, okay. So um, those 48 units under state law is what this commission and what Workbench is, is allowed to have by right um, by state law. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Those 48 units. Okay. Um, the conversion ADUs then are not... Um, we have there's discretion there. We're not required to approve those. That's not mixed. That's a separate Yes, I just want to make sure that's, that's clear. Can you clarify that for the public because you know in the staff report it was difficult to decipher it You know, maybe I'm slow, but it took me a minute to decipher But so I just want to make that clear that what we're what we're required to approve and what workbench is allowed is the 48 units correct no. Well, he nodded you, while you, you said no. You are required to have the 49 units, and you're also required to approve the storage spaces. But we, and those, we're required to approve the storage spaces. Correct. But and not, then those, yes, and then those storage spaces will be converted. We're trying to be transparent with the public because those, those storage spaces are going to be converted to ADUs. Correct, but we don't have to approve that's, the... Let me, yes, let me finish. Yeah, that's, that's right. You're correct. We do <laughs> not have to... They, they can... The units are what they're allowed, correct? Which ones? The ADUs or the, the no, SROs? No, the 48 units. I'm just, yep. I just want to be clear because there's a lot of talk of we have no discretion, we don't have any choices, but there is a choice here. And I just think it's important for you to outline that for us so that we know what those choices are. So let me be clear. We do not under state law and case law have the discretion to remove the storage units. But we can approve, for, for instance, 48 units, and they can do that with four stories, for instance, and that's a, that, that would be within our discretion. No, that is not within your discretion, because under state law and under case law, 
the city is uh, mandated to respond to the application that is set forth before you. So when you look at Bankers Hill versus City of San Diego, or if you look at um, the uh, Wilmer versus uh, City of Berkeley, those two cases are essentially exactly that, where um, the neighbors actually challenged the city in saying that the uh, development application could have been proposed with less open space, could have been proposed with less parking, could have been proposed with fewer amenities, and the courts expressly said, no, that is not correct, and the neighbors were actually seeking to reduce the scale of those buildings. And the court said, no, that is not correct. The law does not say that the project must be devoid of amenities. And it is the city's responsibility to respond to the application that is presented before them and to not make deviations to that. We have very little flexibility under density bonus law. So. So yeah, there is I, a nuance. Okay, there is a nuance with respect to whether or not we're approving those units, because you could. The, the, let me say the whether or not we're approving the ADUs. We are not because approving the ADUs because technically we're not approving the yeah, ADUs. Let's be clear. That's yeah. what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I feel is very important to make clear to us and the public, which I felt was not clear in the staff report. So, if if that could be made clear, that's important. Yeah, um, it's it's tricky because we're trying to be transparent about it and say that these are going to be units. Well, we can be transparent by by including all the information in both of our choices, right? I mean, it, it's not really it's not really a choice, though. But it is a choice. Okay, we have a disagreement here. But 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 it, this is a really important point. We can, I'll get to the public and then we can discuss this later. But sure. Commissioner Gordon. It was closely related, so I'll wait. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other questions of staff from the commission? Okay, seeing none, does the developer have a presentation? Okay, thank you. Could you introduce yourself and yes. also tell us how long you're intending to present tonight? Certainly. Uh, my name is Jamila Cannon. I am a founding member of Workbench and the project exec executive on the Food Bin project. Um, we're the project architect. Doug Wallace is the owner of the Food Bin and the developer for the project. We had a presentation prepared, but Ryan covered most of it. So in the effort to save time, I just want to respond to a few comments and things that I've heard this evening. And I can take mm -hmm. three to five minutes. Okay, that's, that's just fine. You do have the, the right to make a presentation as do the appellants, but okay. thank you for letting us know. Yeah, Ryan covered it, and we're here to answer questions if anybody has additional questions. Um, so I do want to say that between January 29th and April 23rd, we received two appeals and a very long bullet point list of issues from the neighbors, as well as an appeal justification documentation. So it was a lot of information to respond to. We worked really closely with the city, with Doug, to figure out what were things that the project could hold and could handle, and what were things that we felt were really a burden and couldn't be absorbed within the project. There was also a lot, as you guys saw, very complicated information going back and forth and interpretation of state law. How do we <laughs> look at this issue that Commissioner Kennedy brought up where the general plan could, should maybe prevail over the setbacks of the Mission Street overlay zone. So lots of super complicated information. We redid drawings five times between, four or five times between January 29th and today, and, um, and often really quickly in an effort to get something to the city council in time or to staff in time. So I just wanna say that there's a lot of very complicated information out there. Um, we're happy to answer questions if any of it's not clear or um, hard to get at. And then, um, Commissioner, I, I think just for clarity purposes, in that base density diagram, there were two ways to approach it. So we could have approached the revisions with the ADUs, which is the way we chose to approach it. We could have also just utilized the second density bonus and done a very similar base diagram and some updated calculations and not gone through the ADU route. So there were two ways to get at the 59 units that the client would like to build on the project. We chose to do the ADUs. 
uh, there's an impact fee reduction with the ADUs. The larger units are nice, um, nicer for residents, you know, my, mostly for those two reasons. So I think Ryan covered most of the rest of what I was going to talk about. So I'll leave it at that and happy to answer questions. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> Commissioners have questions of the developer? Not at this time. Well, I have one. I have one. <clears throat> um, well, I apologize. I've had a couple more months to think about your project, so I have a few more thoughts that I wanted to air. Uh, I don't apologize for the thoughts, but just for bringing them back again, you know. Um, that mural on the back side of the building, up Laurel, <coughs> that you'll be able to see from the entire <coughs> west side, is that really a great idea? I was thinking about that today. I know it's pretty micromanaging. <coughs> Do you have alternate suggestions? Well, I, I saw there's a process for that. Do you think that will solve that? No, I think the process is very complicated and um, and not really in the purview of the neighborhood to ask for. Okay, so I'm not making a joke here. This is pretty important to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we talked about it last time we were here in January, like the dark side and the neighbor side <coughs> of the corridor versus the commercial corridor where you want light and fun and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm just going to put that out there that it seems like that mural would be the first thing on mission that I can think of that's kind of turning that, you know, billboard back toward the neighborhood. So not, sorry, Commissioner Kenny, just so I understand, yeah, yeah. not the one that's on the corner of Laurel Love and... that one. It's great. Don't okay. even care if it's a monarch butterfly or what. Okay, I see. Yeah, but it um, just seemed like if I'm a neighbor and I'm looking at that big mural every day from Laurel Street or Escalona, mm. it might be different than a flat wall. Don't know that anyone has specifically brought that up or that we've really discussed that in any more detail. Okay. I don't so. think it's worth a condition, but I wanted okay. to bring it up. Yeah. I apologize. I thought you were discussing the one on the corner of no, Mission No, that's okay. I, I okay. should be clear. I have kind of two more like this when we get to the, the right spot, but that seemed like a question. Just like the neighbors aren't like, we love that mural. That's our favorite one. Have you got any? You guys have been talking a lot, but um, have you got any feedback? Not specifically in any in terms of guidance, like we'd love to see this instead. Yeah. There yeah. hasn't been any of that. Okay. Thanks for uh, answering. Yeah. That was my question. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. I have a question about um, wanting to um, not be ready for restaurant use. And so I, I've got some questions around that because I don't know that I've ever seen a specialty grocery store not offer coffee or like even basic things. And so I'm curious, I know that in the conditions of approval, you have to go through a special use permit to get those things, but we're currently working on a new building here that the TI, the client has come to us and it's, it's not, we're not, we're having to solve it in not a great way. It's not ideal. And so I'm wondering what the real plan is if we're really talking about transparency and what's happening, you know, what's happening with this. So I, I believe the way the um, condition of approval is written is it's, it's extensive. So it includes things like the grease interceptor and ejector and the stuff that's very, very expensive, the infrastructure that's very expensive to install. Doug has no intention of needing that robust of a system. He intends to put the food bin back. If there's grab and go coffee, that's much smaller. That's some sinks and much smaller infrastructure than, than the way the condition's written. Yeah, I, I understand. I was part of making sure that that was in every condition for a new building. And the reason why is that Doug's business isn't going to be there forever. And we want a thriving community with a commercial ground floor. And so it has been something that has been a repeated thing for many years in Santa Cruz doing commercial work. And so we feel that it is valuable as a commission and as a city, and that's why it is on the conditions of approval, because that business isn't going to be there forever, and it will limit what the experience is on Mission Street. And so um, I just was curious, because... It's, it's not just a couple sinks to do coffee or to do 
baked goods or anything, you do need a grease trap and it will be an alternative system that's not ideal. So I'm curious what the long, like, I'm sure Doug knows what his plan is for grab and go and food and when will he be applying for a special use permit to do this? Hey, good evening. Yeah, um, I mean, what we do now, it's pretty much, think of it like you either make it and sell it or you buy it and sell it. So we'd probably be in the buy it and sell it in that range. So just keeping it simple so we don't have to add all the additional things. So, you know, use other vendors to, to bring the fresh in, if you will. So there's no intent in, in you applying for a special use permit to do food I mean, the in the location? Not right no, not right now. That's not, yeah, it's not in the cards. Thank you. Any other questions of the developer? Okay, in that case, um, does the appellant, uh, actually, I think we have two appellants. Do you have a presentation? This evening, is the appellant here? Is the appellant here? I'm. I'm. Okay. Uh, seeing none. In that case, uh, we will move on to opening the public hearing. Um, at this time, members of the public are invited to address the commission. If you're interested, please line up over here. It's very helpful if you sign in um, prior to speaking. Um, and but please do introduce yourselves. You have three minutes, and we're interested in what you have to say. And thank you for coming. All right, good evening, Commission. Um, I would like to say it's good to see you again, but I wish it weren't for this project. Um, I would like to raise some complaints about this project, mainly that it has taken so goddamn long to get it approved. It's been just about six months since it was approved the first time by you folks, and we're here again. Um, that's six months where people won't be living in these apartments, though they may still be driving into Santa Cruz. It's time that the food bin has to spend on this project, not focusing on providing a great community grocery store is time and money the food bin has to spend on not providing great services and a great grocery store in our community. And that means higher rents for the people that are going to live here. I hope we can move this along as fast as possible. I know there's demand for it in Santa Cruz. It's something I would have loved to live in in my time here as a student at UC Santa Cruz. As somebody who doesn't own a car now, I'd still consider living there. It's freaking awesome. I know there are at least 59 people who don't own cars in Santa Cruz. I think we can all agree with that. And I think there's a lot of them that would like to not be paying extra money for their rent for a car parking space that they do not use. This project is on a fantastic transit corridor in our city. It's on Mission Street where we should be putting a lot of dense housing. It makes sense environmentally, it makes sense for transportation, it makes sense for affordability, and it makes sense when we think of the future of our city. Please accept the staff recommendation, move this project forward, and let's get more housing in Santa Cruz. Thank you. My name is Ryan Meckel. I'm a lead with Santa Cruz EMB and a renter in the city of Santa Cruz. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you. Hello, my name is Gavin Roth, a student at Mission Hill Middle School. Uh, my uh, comments will be brief, but I would just urge you to deny the appeal, approve the project. Like my little sign here says, we want homes for people, not for cars. And this project kind of exemplifies that. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Good evening, Planning Commission. My name is Bruce Thomas. I live on Dufour Street in the west side. And I, I just want to bring up a very um, serious public safety concern that keeps happening and I keep seeing in projects. 
And specifically, I'm particularly concerned about the city approving plans that use Mission Street, Hi California Highway 1, as a loading zone for large delivery trucks. This is stipulated in Condition 69 of the Conditions of Approval. Having delivery trucks park on Highway 1 to make deliveries is dangerous and poses a serious threat to the health and safety of the delivery personnel, as well as to the health and safety of the public driving on Highway 1. So I really, I see a lot of projects happening like this. And I'll look directly at you, and Dr. Mr. Butler, about the planning department is proving things, and that doesn't seem like good planning if you're relying on a California state highway for a loading zone. So I would like that to be um, visited, and in the future, I would like future plans to address that and not allow that to happen. So, um, and then I really do think we are in a new reality here in light of the new, new realities of SAB 2097 and whatnot, where limited parking will be established in the new developments. And I would like to see, see the city create a uh, parking and traffic impacts task force to discuss um, ways we can address the challenges that we're going to face when we keep building things with very limited parking. That's my two comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Mason. I'm currently a student at UC Santa Cruz, and I would just like to say very briefly that I think we should um, approve the um, food bin as it would be very helpful. Um, I know I'm just a freshman at UC Santa Cruz, but so many students, when I talk to them, that is their number one issue is currently rent and housing. It is the issue when you talk to any student on campus, and I'm here as a part of the Student Housing Coalition, and we would really um, like you guys to approve the food bin. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hello, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Nicolas Robles. I'm a third year at UCSC. I'm also part of the UCSC Student Housing Coalition. Um, thank you for your wonderful presentation, Mr. Butler. Uh, I just wanted to say on behalf of the Student Co Housing Coalition that we would love to deny the appeal and approve the project of the food bin. We would love to see more housing be available towards um, students and then everybody else here at UC Santa Cruz. Right now, I broke my... <laughs> Uh, bones a couple days ago and I'm in a lot of pain but I still wanted to come out here to show my support for this project because I thought it was important and I thought that since you guys have already approved it um, the last time I was here uh, I think it would be a project you guys would still love to support currently um, it would provide a lot of a lot more housing a lot more opportunities for the food bin and keep a lot of um, money circulating locally inside of Santa Cruz instead of being given to bigger businesses like Safeway or Trader Joe's. Um, and plus, like everybody loves the food bin right now. And so um, why not just make it better? A bunch of students would love to shop there too. And I mean, they would love to get more snacks available just after after class, right after, the, right after they get off the bus which the metro is expanding, so the services are going to be circulating a lot more, too. So, I mean, the concerns about parking and where cars are going to go, I don't think is going to be that big of a deal when the metro is expanding and, like, a lot of students will be using the metro services, too. Um, plus, like, right now we're working with a lot more people to get uh, more transit-oriented ori transportation around UCSC and with the expansion of college students coming in here because we have like a 130% admittance rate at UCSC currently. Um, there's just going to be a lot more students just going around Santa Cruz in general. So um, that just means a lot more customers and you're always going to just need more housing in general. And so please uh, we would love to get more support on this project and just build it. <laughs> and so, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hi. My name's Pamela San Miguel. I live Could you pull the microphone down? Sorry. <laughs> thank you. My name's Pamela San Miguel. Um, I live next door to the food bin on Mission Street. Um, I'm 
I don't have any problem with building. I think we need building in the city. Um, I think that we do need to reduce rents. I have a problem with the location of the building. Nobody is bringing up the environmental impact. That property borders Laurel Creek. Laurel, Laurel Creek is an important waterway. Um, it supports an, a, 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 a thriving, although struggling because of the encroaching urban development. It, it, Could you please speak into the microphone? Sorry, and I'm sure it gets sorry. Recorded. <laughs> um, I hadn't planned on speaking today. It's just I'm surprised. It's just the the nobody's mentioning the environmental impact of the project, and I think it's the location that this the, the location is wrong. You know this this the property at Mission Street, the food bin, and also Emily's. But I don't think that the Emily's project is is going to do any sort of environmental impact that this one will. The, the sheer size of it. Um, there's a there's a breeding hawk uh, nesting pair um, that the 1130 1132 Mission Street there encompasses their territory. Um, the hawk's territory includes the Mission Street food bin um, property, and um, hawks are protected under the Migratory Species Act. Um, I don't know. They hunt right along the creek. Um, they they do a wonderful job at at keeping down the rodent population, native voles and, and, and rats too, city rats. Um, I really, really urge you to strongly reconsider approving this project um, based strictly on its location next to the creek. Um, that creek, it, it's, a, it's an important waterway because of the fact that it borders Mission Street Highway, which is Highway 1. All of the animals, there's a ton of animals that use that as a passageway that they're not crossing over Highway 1. And it protects us humans, too, from getting into car accidents with animals that are crossing over the highway. If we don't take care of that, that waterway and protect it, we're going to have a lot of problems with animals interacting with humans. Um, I really urge you strongly, strongly, please, please consider the environmental impact, please. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, hi. Hello, commissioners. Uh, my name is Bennett Williamson. Um, came down here from Felton to uh, speak about this project. Uh, I support this project. And I really urge you to reject the appeal and approve it. Um, I think the amount of support that you've seen, young people, students coming out for this, really shows that there's a lot of demand for this kind of housing. It's a really unique, really unique project. These very low income units these are the, seriously the type of units when we're talking about the people in our community that we want to be housed. We need to generate as many of these as soon as we can, as fast as we can. And I really applaud the developer for finding ways to continue to use the state laws to create, to keep the same amount of units in this project. I think, you know, developers are having to be really creative because cities have been standing in their way for years. But I do, I do want to say that I saw this commission uh, speak about this project last time in January, and I really appreciated um, what you had to say, uh, Commissioner Conway. You mentioned specifically, you said, let's not put too many conditions on this project because how many times have we increased the cost of these projects with expensive conditions? And Commissioner Polamis, you said, when people were bringing up the base density and, and the FAR, you said, look, let's keep the big perspective in mind. These few units Every building that we put those in were one of the only places in the whole state that met our housing element, right? And so I really appreciate you keeping that perspective in mind. And so um, with that in mind, yeah, I'd really urge you to approve this project tonight. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hello, commissioners. Uh, my name is Lola Quiroga. I'm a UCSA student third year, um, also lead with Santa Cruz UMB and member of the Student Housing Coalition. I want to urge you to support this project. Um, I'm a car-free student myself, and I would love to live in this project. I know so many students who live in single-family homes in this neighborhood car-free already. I'm one of them. I, I'm lucky enough to live in a triplex, but I live on Mission and Walnut, which is super close, and I use that same bus line. Um, at least three times a week um, when I'm not biking. And I know it's possible to be car free on this corridor and improvements are coming to Mission Street. In 2026, Caltrans is investing in bus stop improvements and 
making Mission Street safer for pedestrians, which is really awesome. And then we have so many active transportation projects throughout our city that are also going to be, you know, hitting um, in 2026 and beyond. We have Bay Street improvements, which is going to be awesome. Like being able to commute from the food bin to UCSC is going to be completely doable by bike and actually safe. I do it, but it's not safe. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, as a student, I've had to move five times in the two and a half years I've lived here. And to be able to have stable housing, like, that's awesome and mixed use would be would be just be awesome. Yeah, I every place I've lived is market rate. So if that's an argument to not build this project, I, I don't understand it. Um, yeah, please support this project. And thank you, staff. And we're really lucky to have staff that supports change and really understands, like, why building housing is so important in our community. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Would anybody else like to address the commission this evening? Uh, seeing none, I will close the public hearing and return to the commission for deliberation and a recommendation. Can I ask a question of the developer? Of course. Jamila, I think your name was Jamili. Can you come, can you come up so I can mic, ask please? a question? Thank you. Um, can you talk about, if you can volunteer to talk about what the business model is going to be for this project? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, Commissioner. Um, so, so the students who came up made me think about this. So my. Um, so my daughter is a student at Berkeley, and this year when we were looking for housing, what we found was in Berkeley, if you've been up there recently, there's loads of new development up there. They're really building housing like we are here in Santa Cruz along the Shattuck Corridor, um, a lot of high-density housing like we are here. But what they're doing, um, the, the housing that they're building, is um, it's, it's really interesting. What's happening is that they are building in a model where um, it directly competes with dorms, and so that you rent a bed in a in a in a room, and you don't have to be responsible for finding a roommate. Um, that's up to the manager, and they have doubles and triples. And so, if your roommate moves out, you're not responsible for finding another roommate. That's the responsibility of the the project. And so. I just was curious. It seems like that that's, this project would be perfect for that. I mean, I, f I figured it was probably going to be mostly rented by students anyway, but then it occurred to me that maybe that was the model that you were going to use. We haven't, we're not running the pro forma with that kind of a model, and I, I don't think Doug intends to manage the building in that kind of a way. They'll be rented as units. Doug, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But, so, um, yeah, familiar with that, and thank you for clarifying. But no, that's not the intention on this project. Is there a name for that model? If you're familiar with it, I mm -hmm. no. Okay, I had never seen it before this year. So, but Berkeley only houses about 25 percent of their students. UCSC houses more like 40. But clearly, the university needs to build a lot more housing, and I hope the students are advocating to the university as well. I can Thank you. tell you from the Energy Co. perspective, it's a lodging house and not a residence. What's that? It's a lodging house and not a residence. Okay. Like from our Energy Co. perspective. I see. That's about what I know. But it's new and, and causing all sorts of code problems. Okay. Commissioner Thompson. Uh, just a, a couple of comments. I wasn't here um, uh, for the for the first hearing on this. But um, I, I I really like this project. It is, um, it's, it's aggressive. It, it tries to... Um, I can get as many units on here as possible, but this is exactly what's missing in our housing market. Um, we have, by some estimates, 40% um, of our population are essentially single people. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that they, they would be single person households if there was a household, uh, uh, a residence for them to rent. Um, and uh, as a, a former landlord who dealt with, um, with tenants, um, uh, quite frankly, the, uh, the, the unrelated um, roommates' uh, households are the ones that are difficult um, because they um, tend to be rather short term and uh, they uh, creating a household 
is not as simple as just deciding to split the check uh, for the rent. Um, so uh, I'm, I think it's really important for our city to um, continue in the, uh, in the phase that we're in right now where a large portion of our new housing are small units. Um, this is true in some of the stuff downtown. And um, it's not connected necessarily with affordability. Um, but um, I consider it kind of a, a, a social, um, a, of social importance to be able to provide housing that fits the households. And so single person households have had to um, make up a household <laughs> to, um, to fit into the housing um, uh, 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 inventory that we have had historically. When I, I came here 53 years ago, um, there was uh, virtually no place for a single person to live. Um, I, I, I lived for the first year in a motel um, because I convinced the landlord, <laughs> the owner of the motel, to to rent me the room. But at least I had a room, um, and uh, we've certainly done a lot better. But projects like this, um, uh, we should be encouraging as much as we can because not just because it's housing but it's the housing that's missing um, so I'm a I'm a vote to approve this project thank you Commissioner McKelvey just to follow on that comment I also often hear um, dissent that you know if it's a small unit project like the one that's proposed it's the wrong kind because it's not for families. But my feeling about this is that if you do give an option to people that are small households that are currently sharing large homes, family homes that are in neighborhoods, then that f perhaps frees up family homes that are in the neighborhoods for people to use. So I think I, I agree with you 100%. I, I just think that it's um, there are a lot of scenarios. We think we, we, we come up with these scenarios about everyone fits in to a box and there are just a million different household types that you know could could benefit from having more options thank you other comments commissioner gordon i think i i think i i, I mean i definitely share the sentiment of more housing um I don't, I think this, I mean, I wasn't here the night that this was approved, I, I think, but we have a history of approving projects like this. I have two things. One is I don't know that we've really done a planning job. Maybe there's information out there that I'm unaware of, but of how many SROs are enough. I mean, we see, we've seen a lot of them. And so I'm wondering like from a planning perspective and urban planning perspective, at what point is that type of housing that we're filling enough and and what are we what are we striving for because that's always a question that i have and we we're seeing a disproportionate amount of that housing and so i'd like to know you know from a community perspective what our goal is for that so but that i just was sort of on the tail of that i agree and there's also more to that and so um, I, I mean, in, since I have the mic, I mean, in general, I don't have a problem with creating housing. I do have a problem with how this particular project is showing up in the community, and it's making it very difficult for us as commissioners and council members to navigate that in the community because of the way that the developer and the and the owner has navigated this. And um, so... You know, I just, I, I, there, are, there are challenges with it. It's allowed. Should it be this way? You know, that's that's subjective. We're not in a subjective environment right now, and that's the challenge that the community has with with having to accept projects in their backyard like this. So, my motion would be to add a condition of approval, even though we have a history of not wanting to add conditions. Um, but in the effort of transparency and um, concern for the health and safety and environmental concerns of the community, 
that we put a condition of approval that the uh, that the developer and the owner uh, get a second um, report, environmental report, a biotics report, and a traffic report that is actually done by the city but paid for by the developer. So that would be a condition that I would recommend. Are you making a motion or are I you am actually. you're going to? Oh, I am. I, I, yeah, I'm both. Okay. <laughs> How about that? So I make a motion that, um, that, the, that we add a condition of approval, that the developer get a second biotics report and traffic study. So could I clarify that your motion is to um, move the staff recommendation with an additional condition? Is that, is that, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I want to clarify. Yes. I could second that if it, the motion was modified to um, to indicate that we're approving 48 units absent the ADUs. Um, because, and the reason why is because I think it sets a terrible precedent to approve something that uh, is not required for us uh, to approve. And so I just think that that um, opens up a Pandora's box. Uh, the, the 48 units is what we're required to approve by state law, and that's what I'm prepared to do. If, if I might, um, I appreciate uh, this discussion, but I, I would suggest that we're not quite ready for a motion. We're, well, we still Tim Murray made a motion, and so, so I am responding. And there was no second, so, so I was we, responding. We don't have a second, and what I was suggesting is maybe we have a little more discussion before we're ready. Um, uh, unless she's fishing for a second, that's fine. She's fishing for a second. I gave her an option, and I'm uh, open. Uh, but it's a revision, a second and a revision. So I was, just wasn't. The motion sure. maker has to approve can, or not approve that. Can I take it back, and we have more discussion because that's what I'm hearing. I'm fine uh, with. Yes, you can take it off the table. Okay, and yes. we will we will be returning. We have some really important points on the table, and I don't want to lose them. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, and I don't think that we're going to have a problem crafting a motion that we can we can support. So your point was you want additional studies. Um, so, so that's under discussion. And Commissioner Dan, your point is that you are in support of a 48 unit project. Would you like to speak to that further? I don't know that I have much to add other than what I already said. Um, I mean, um, I put it out there, and I'll, I'll okay. folks respond. I can respond further when other folks so have something to say about unit it. Project, okay. Further discussion. I, I'd like to hear more about that. I heard the kind of line of conversation and where it was going. I'd just like to understand it a little bit further. So I, I get that I mean, you know there's the project with the 48 units, and the discrepancy is going to be between the units and the convertible ADUs. Correct. Exactly. I mean, I think what was before the commission, as I understand it, in January was a 59-unit project based on a higher base density, which with the density bonus added up to 59. So what I'm suggesting is basically just to do exactly what you guys did in January, except going off of what the new calculated base density is, which leads to a 48-unit project with the accurate base density and the 50% density bonus adds up to 48 units. So just reading it again, that's what it says, right? 48 SROs? Yes, but I, it's I'm not. I'm totally with you on making this crystal clear yeah. so it doesn't feel like, everyone's already feeling like the shell game's happening. Yeah. So. And I just wanted to say that I agree with Commissioner Gordon in that I believe that the way that Workbench rolled out this project has not been great. And it's made it difficult and confusing and it's, you know, I was on the Santa Cruz County Planning Commission for 16 years, so I'm familiar with, I've, I've approved dozens and dozens of housing projects and have always been fully supportive, especially the 100% affordable projects. Um, and so I've seen many projects come through. This one is unique in that it has not been straightforward. And, and I'm not suggesting that there's been a, like a, a a lack of transparency that's, um, it has the effect of seeming not transparent when I do not, I'm not attributing that 
to workbench, but that is how, that's, that's the impression that one can get when things are um, sprung on the council at the last minute, and there's these amenities, these that are then taken away because they're going to be converted. And it's this project is almost creating the illusion of a better project with all the amenities when really Workbench is planning to use those amenities in a different way. And so I think that's what, for me at least, speaks to the lack of transparency on the part of Workbench, the developer in this project. Um, but again, I support the project. I uh, support 48 units um, because that's what's clear and in the code and what the state law says. And so that's, that's what I'm willing to support. Um, Mr. Bain, could I ask you to put up those conditions of approval um, just because? Um, Do you have a version that's not so tiny? Yeah, they're difficult to read. Like the PDF. And the numbering is is confusing also, that they're all number 67. Um, oh, how did that happen? Oh. Also got confusing. It's the computer. Sorry, that must yeah. have been the conversion when I took it to the PowerPoint. Sorry. No, I do understand it, but it is hard to read, and um, and I do think that yeah. they're important. Um, so not not to distract, but um, I think that I think that these are important points. Um, uh, yes, Commissioner Kennedy. So I have one little condition to tidy up, and then I'd like to add one too. We can talk about more. Um, I just wanted to follow on the comments about the developer. I've been up here a long time. I've been doing this from way before all these state laws changed. And I had some heartburn about this one, too. I really want to be clear about perception versus intent, like you. You know, it just came out wrong. And whether you can do it by state law or not, the important thing in this community is talking to people and really having a constructive conversation. I get it. I mean, I can't believe people were physically pushed at the last hearing. So. You know, that's kind of a one-way conversation sometimes, and I understand that. And I'm not saying this project should kowtow the neighbors or, you know, do exactly what they want, but it was pretty disappointing to hear it was coming back to us again. And um, I don't know what could help it, but um, I want to again say these ones on the edge of the corridors are really problematic. Julie, we've talked about maybe having a subcommittee to think more about that. So the, the condition I'll offer once there's a motion has to, is one of these ones that like, could apply to every one of these projects in town, and I'd like to workshop it on this project a little bit um, when mm -hmm. the time is right. But maybe we should get a motion in a second. And then... well, I think we still have comments coming in. I, I'm, I sense some um, revised conditions brewing, and it's nice to get them all out on the table while, while we're under discussion. Does anybody else have comments now? I, oh, I'm just going to uh, elaborate a little bit on okay. what, what I the condition that I put on because it directly relates to this perception, and I am sure that you care about the community, and I'm sure that you care about the environment and the neighbors, and um, the real only subjective uh, thing in this. Well, there's a couple subjective things, Rachel is bringing up one and I'm bringing up the other, which is where these reports came from when they were done and the traffic report being done in August. And is that really reflect, you know, what the actual conditions are? Um, and so I think it's, it's important to, if you want to be a team player in this community, to meet the community where they're at and health and safety and the environment are really important factors. And so I would guess that this condition wouldn't be hard for you to want to make sure that the community feels like this isn't impacting those things because these state laws are all the things but one of the things that they do not you know that that, that the only way that a community can get around these state laws is if if we're sure that the health safety and the environment are not being impacted and so that's why I feel like it's important. It's not because I want to over condition. It's because the community deserves that, and there are concerns about it. And um, and I feel like it would be a gesture that would heal this community a little bit um, in in this process. That okay. Thank thank you for that. Um, I have a comment that's a little less, um, a, a little bit more in the weeds than that, but. Um, 
First of all, I, I want to say it's really clear, partly from the extensive list of um, additional conditions of approval, that there's been a lot of conversation going on. And I see this really, for the most part, as um, really an attempt to work with concerns raised by um, the neighbors. And I appreciate that. I also appreciate that it was done with a lot of pressure, a lot of time pressure. Um, I'm just picking out one. Um, and I'd like to say that I feel like it is really fair to pay for the solar of the neighbor. And um, I appreciate that that was added. Solar impacts are important. And I think that the city should find a way to, um, to address them. So for years, we've wrestled with um, our housing shortage. We've developed land use policies that try to preserve our neighborhood character by focusing density on transportation corridors. I believe we can protect our open space. We can protect our low density neighborhoods. And we can meet our housing need but there's going to be taller buildings, and every single one of them is going to have a next door neighbor. And uh, not all of them are going to lose solar access in the same way that this one is. Um, but I really do appreciate that you volunteered to, um, to address that issue. Um, and so I think partly we're hearing now a lot of frustration um, with this process. I agree with Commissioner Kennedy. It's having, when something is as complicated as, um, as this kind of a project, having it be confusing um, and you know, rendering different things is, is um, not that surprising. But I also think that um, trust with our community is really important. And especially in, we're, we're at a time where we've been talking about additional density and talking about taller buildings for years. And I think we've built an awful lot of consensus about the need to do that and a surprising amount of, of acceptance of that. But now when the rubber is hitting the road um, and the, we're actually seeing buildings come forward, I think building trust with the community is more important than it's ever been. Okay, there's, there's my soapbox. I do appreciate the efforts. Um, we have um, a complicated recommendation that we're asked to make um, to the city council, and that is our action tonight is, is really a recommendation to the council. I do feel like the conditions of approval are important. I've heard uh, one of them, let's see, and, and there's so many and they're so small, I can't find them easily, but I believe one of them about the, the grease trap was, was proposed. Um, it was proposed as a, I believe, a concession, which um, the developer has a right to make, um, to make a, a density bonus building feasible. Um, there's some pushback on that, that, you know, I think both sides are reasonable, but I'd like to highlight that one. And I think we have, are there any other specific conditions that people would like to discuss before we get to the point of making a motion? Yes. I have one more, sorry. Okay. Um, I do have a question about moving delivery as close to, or on mission as much as possible. And what has been, I couldn't really find a lot of drawings or understanding of like, what is that gonna look like? Is that looking like a, pull out curb cut like what what is the city requiring for that type of infrastructure you know Tim, you weren't here last time right no has that Maybe was that addressed should, I just describe what deliveries he gets he described that at the last meeting and that might help your discussion um, like how many trucks and where just a thought i actually <coughs> i actually watched it so oh, yeah um so so there will, like, so that was, that the commission felt that was fully addressed because I thought that this was a new, con I thought maybe this was a new condition. No, I was, was just trying that. to loop you in because the applicant last time said kind of which deliveries he could Right, and I thought it was in relationship to it. be able to pull into the underground parking because the truck height was an issue with the underground parking. I didn't think that it was related to pulling over on Mission Street. And so my question is, what is the infrastructure that's being put into place to accept delivery off of Mission? You know, I can say um, as a neighbor um, and who goes out for a run in the early morning, 
uh, when deliveries are being made, it's not a problem. There isn't any traffic. There's, you know, um, I realize that that may not be always the condition, but I don't worry about that one at all. And it doesn't block bike lanes or anything? It does. There's just it, not many people there. It's just okay. not, you know, it's just not an issue. There's, right. enough, okay. there's enough room at that time of day. Okay. They come. Did you have a comment? Thank you. Clarification. Hi, everyone. Yeah, Matt Sturkey here, Transportation Manager. Happy to clarify Mission Street. I think, um, as you were mentioning, one of the benefits of that right lane is it is 14 feet wide, and we don't have a bike. There is no bike lane on Mission Street. So if loading were to happen there at a odd hour, it's, it's not a large traffic concern. And I, I believe you were referring to the uh, new condition in here that speaks to um, the, if you, if, uh, yeah, the curbside loading space within the Laurel Street right away. And if you go back to the plans there, Ryan. Um, so on the bottom left there, um, they, uh, that's where you'd be looking to add the additional loading, on-street loading, correct? That's an existing loading zone today. Right, existing yeah. loading. So that would be, that would essentially be maintained, and that's what that condition is speaking to. Uh, no, I'm sorry. The time for the um, public to address the commission is closed. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, go ahead. One of the thoughts I had was regarding that solar condition that you mentioned. So okay. maybe should, I should just finish that thought. <coughs> this is, I agree with you, there's impact, particularly to this property. If you look at the shading study, which is in the plans, which is super helpful, it really defines kind of like when the impact is and how severe it will be. So I really appreciate the shading study. It looked like pretty right on to me. Um, so the lower left is how it feels to the neighbors. No, I'm kidding. That's 9 a.m. in the winter. That's a very low sun, right? Big, big shadows. That house is going to be in the shade all the time in the winter because he's next to a corridor. Fine. But then you see, you know, the, the top row is solar maximum. Sun's as high as it could be. Not so bad. Minor deal. So I do appreciate the volunteered $10,000. And I'd like to suggest that that's just given without this exercise of like triaging the PV, because I think it would be, it might work out to be less than $10,000. And this is my idea, so thank you for doing it. And I'm not going to punish you by just giving the money. <laughs> this is my favorite picture. He's losing 23% of his total solar. So it still has 70 Absolutely. Mm -hmm. still not perfect, but. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying this is fair in any way, but I just felt we should simplify it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we should speak uh, a little bit further and to discuss the question of the number of units and the conversion of the ADUs. Um, appreciate your point, and I think it is really important that um, all of us understand it. Certainly the council needs to understand it, and I think the neighbors need to understand it also. Um, and. Uh, the clarification that what is allowed is 48 units through the density bonus is, I think, really clear. I think that was made. Um, my understanding of the, the way that dealing with the, the uh, looking at this project differently um, by creating the storage space and then immediately knowing that they're going to be ADUs. The ADU is, is, is not discretionary. The conversion of that storage um, is not discretionary. So, um, and, you know, once they get their approval, they, they can come in with their, they, and they will come in um, with their building plans that will be um, converted ADUs, and we have some big, some larger units. Thank you, by the way, for being willing to deed restrict them um, as affordable more than you needed to. Um, I really appreciate you doing that. Um, so I think what you're saying is not that it's not going to be that number of units. It's that you want the project that's approved to be a 48-unit project for the sake of clarity, even though we know it's going to be a 59-unit project. Yes, on the first part, and mm -hmm. that's up to the council, right? It's not up to us. So the council will do what they're gonna, going to do 
Um, and then I just want to say one more. I, I, I'm just let me just because uh, I want to hear your, your next point, and I might just be wrong, but my understanding is that it isn't discretionary. That that um, that space can be converted um, if that space is there. But what I'm saying though is, um, the council can do what they're going to do. Um, so I don't. I don't. There are a lot of ways to cut this cake, okay. is what I'm saying. And is I'd like that, to hear how you want to cut it. Well, I'm not going to make suggestions in that. I'm just, I'm, what I want to, and, you know, we can disagree and folks can go in a different direction. I'm just outlining what what I'm prepared to do mm -hmm. with what I've, my read of state law, which would be in, in conformance and mirror what this commission did in January based on what was the calculated base density in January. So I'm just taking what happened at the commission in January and applying it today with what is the base density calculated and the project in front of us right now. And the, but I do want to point something out about the ADUs that I also found um, upsetting, frankly, and that, that uh, in the staff report, I think it indicated that um, the ADUs are not subject to impact fees because they're, un they're going to be under, so should the uh, storage space be converted, um, those would not be subject to impact fees because they're under 750 square feet. Yet that does seem like a little bit of a way to get out of paying impact fees um, since you know they're shown in the project, we're being told by staff they're going to be converted, they're gonna be larger than the SROs, yet they won't be subject to impact fees, which it seems like for a homegrown workbench as a homegrown developer, many of the employees are raising kids here. It does seem a little, uh, you know, I mean, these are amenities that we all use and enjoy as community members. And so to, it seems like a little bit of a way to get out of paying those um, public benefit impact fees rubs me the wrong way, frankly. Um, so I just wanted to point that out as another uh, reason. You no, know, something else to, to take a look at and for staff to think about in the future when we see these projects um, coming online. Mr. Butler. Thanks for those comments, Commissioner Dan. Um, and yeah, they're, they're very valid. Um, the state law prohibits the uh, us from requiring payment of impact fees for that um, and so that's um, and and then we've got the the state law mandates of saying yes we have to allow up to 25 percent of the units to convert to ADUs and so that sort of series um, does tie our hands in terms of what is required what we excuse me what we can what we can require I get it no I, I, I get that I'm, I, I'm I just sure the to city would would want to collect those fees. I, I you're, get it. You're yeah. correct. And um, yeah, I, I want to make it clear for the public that it's not, that it, it's a state law that we're following. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. I, I should have said that, that it's not a city requirement, that that's a state law that the developer is taking advantage of. Yeah, thank you. Is it a local um, <coughs> or a state law that you are able to change after? during the design process into an ADU, storage into ADU? Great question. The state law calls out um, that you can convert existing space, and um, it doesn't really define what existing space is. We've actually come across instances where developers were in the process of um, constructing a building, and we, uh, and they wanted to convert that. So that existing space, if you take it, literally could be, all right, well, you frame up that building, and then once you frame it up, then it's existing space, or does it have to be finished space? Do you have to finish that garage? So we actually locally have a law that says existing space can also be entitled space. So what that does is it means that you don't have to go through the time and expense of, say, finaling a garage only to immediately then tear that out and uh, create an ADU out of it. So our, our local law clarifies and arguably expands upon that state law in a manner to create efficiencies and cost savings for developers. So 
we are, our local laws actually promote the production of ADUs through um, things like what uh, Workbench is proposing. Um, so thanks for that, that clarification because, um, you know, it, it came up and, and there was that question. And so we um, updated our local laws so that it would be clear. Mr. Polhamus. Thank you. Um, yeah, a lot of really good comments. Um, I'm just going to briefly just state that, um, again, I think this is a, like Commissioner Thompson said, just kind of uh, right in the vein of what we need. Um, I hear Commissioner Dan's comments uh, in a big way about the impact fees and just the way that kind of this project came about. It just kind of feels a little funky, but, you know, I think we're getting there. And um, one of the things I do love about this project is it is a local owner, right? We don't always see that. And I think there's big benefits to having a local owner, at least uh, initially. And I think one of the things that I really like too is, and thank you for going a little bit above and beyond the affordability requirements. I think that makes up for, you know, some of this in a big way. So, um, you know, not only is that like an ongoing cost to you. Um, it's an ongoing savings for our community. At least that's the way I look at it. And um, so, you know, of course, it'd be great if this is 100% affordable. That's not always doable, right? And so um, I just want to say thank you for the time and staff. I, I also think it's um, the mark of uh, a, a good a good collection of people that can say, hey, we made a mistake. We're coming back to you. And, uh, you know, we're going to fix this. And so... Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody involved, and um, like Commissioner Thompson, I'm, I'm excited to approve this project. So, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to weigh in as a longtime affordable housing person, and I'm going to say that I actually don't think that all units should be deed-restricted affordable. And um, particularly in a project like this, because if they're deed restricted affordable, then every single person that lives there is going to be income qualified, and you're going to be eliminating people, and some of them are the people you're building it for. So um, I'm actually not in favor of all of our housing being 100% affordable. Just want to make that <laughs> note. <laughs> um. So I've got this other uh, proposed condition. Can we talk about that for a few minutes? Absolutely. I don't mean to micromanage this project, but this comes up on all the corridor ones. <coughs> uh, Ryan, could you put up that elevations page? I think this is an inexpensive thing that we can fix right here that will make the impact much less. Uh, keep going to the, like the straight elevations. I wrote down the sheet number. EP4.01. Yeah, that's it, that's it. That's not the one I'm looking for. Did I say the wrong? I'm sorry, go up to AP 3.02. I gave you the wrong sheet number. All right, so the bottom one here is the west elevation. That faces that house, 1112 Laurel. You heard my comment about the mural already. We'll leave that there. This is, I know this is not fully designed. This is proposing a, a lattice cut metal fence right there at the bottom. Can you point to that? Kind of along that property line. And it looks beautiful. I think there's a lot of spots that will be great. If you could, wouldn't mind skipping back to the floor plan. That's where cars are parking. Like, so as far as I can tell, the headlights of those cars unless the neighbor builds a fence, which they certainly could, is going to just go straight through that porous fence into the neighbor's yard, bedroom windows, et cetera. Right? So you guys weren't here at the other meeting. This neighbor, I know, he bought a property <coughs> is next to a big thing, um, is also looking up at an 18-foot high under deck podium. We talked about this and seeing all these lights and stuff. So I don't want to kill this project, but I want to add a condition saying that that should be a six foot tall concrete block wall provided by this project on their side of the line. What do you all think about that? Should we do a wood fence? I mean, to me, it's like you got to have a concrete block wall there, but that's just my opinion. I admit these things can be expensive, but uh, 
I think with that thin metal screen there. You know, I actually had not caught that that was um, porous and that light was coming through it. It took me like four months to catch it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd support that um, uh, also on an acoustic uh, basis as uh, cars parked and uh, a block wall with like, the auto noise. Seemed reasonable. I thought about eight foot, but who knows what mm -hmm. structural is going to do to you then. So I'd, I'd propose a condition that just simply says we uh, should provide a six foot tall split place CMU block wall on that entire frontage, Lee. I don't know how the setback fence thing works, but we got a zero lot line building right up to the corner there. I think that's a good addition. We'd have to look at uh, what the, the fence height regulations are. Oftentimes in that front setback, they are um, or, or from the road that's mm -hmm. uh, that's on the rear property line, but from that property line, there's oftentimes uh, setbacks. Also, just from a visibility perspective, the, I believe there's a driveway immediately adjacent to that. So we want to facilitate visibility um, for people backing out of that driveway. Sure. So um, I, I understand the intent Good. that you're trying to get at, and I think that's something that we could look at to um, to, to wordsmith a, a condition that meets the intent of the commission's recommendation because um, I'm, I'm sure you're not looking to block uh, visibility from absolutely not nor create an unsafe yeah. condition for the loading right. zone at all right. okay cool and then we could just make that standard and put it on all these projects you know yeah thanks thanks for catching that um I will throw out, I, know, um, I think somewhere in the staff report there was a, um, it cost out the um, additional cost that the developer has agreed to um, through the conditions of approval. Um, I do think it's important to keep that in mind. I, I like Let's this Let's put one. it up. I love yeah, that. Thank I, you for I keeping I thought that score. was really helpful. Mm -hmm. Say that again. Uh, part of the workbench letter describing the changes, uh, we'll show it in a second just says how much this costs them, you know, for each change. And, um, it's really helpful. And it is, uh, it is helpful. Um, and, and to keep in mind that, you know, I've, I think I've probably been the one complaining about hanging new conditions like decorations on a Christmas tree that can really make projects infeasible. So I appreciate that the, the developer is uh, taking on costs that make this, that are really community-minded. Um, and also that they do all add up. And as we're hearing from our um, student housing representatives, we really want to get this project built. Um, so we don't want to make it infeasible. That said, I like this fence um, also um, as, a, as a recommendation. I do as well. And, oh, and I did take a look at this. And, and I just remember we did a similar thing to the hotel. So just, you know, not as not like we're picking on right. mm -hmm. a housing yeah. project. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. <laughs> okay. I think just in, in light of this, though, I think it is important to recognize that we are making concessions financially to them in regards to deferring payments, and then they are exercising something that will not give back to the community, which is our traffic, I mean, which is, our, you know, I mean, with the ADUs and with the, yeah. And the amount of staff time that this has taken and the amount of effort that this has taken that is actually taxpayers' dollars. So I think we also have to recognize that as, as part of the whole here. So while I do appreciate this and I do appreciate the very low income units and those concessions, I mean, it's, it is, it's, it's not just one-sided. <laughs> Thank you, I agree with you, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, so I, I think that um, we may be getting close. I mean, the, the one question is how, um, how this motion is gonna get made. I guess maybe we, are, are we that far along now? I think we've discussed conditions unless there's others. Well, I mean, I think the distinction is the, the if, if, you know, the, the staff recommendation, from my perspective, could be, I mean, I wouldn't be comfortable um, supporting a motion that just supports the staff recommendation because the staff recommendation is, 
frankly kind of vague and um, unspecific. Um, and so that, that's my issue with that. And I would rather um, I'd rather it be more specific. I, I agree with Commissioner Dan. I think that there's some details in there that we should send along to council that could be a little bit more specific um, without overdoing it. <laughs> I'm not sure where that line is, but. <laughs> so I think to be clear, and uh, maybe someone can be clearer than I am, especially if I lose my voice again, but um, I think that, that what you're saying is that we have a 48-unit uh, project um, that meets the um, you know recommendations of a density bonus project, <laughs> and that uh, we are that there's going to be 11 ADU units, but that the project as approved is 48 units, um, and I don't know if you want to acknowledge it. It's going to happen, and it's. I'm know. not prepared to acknowledge that because I don't know what the council will do. Okay. So. Okay. So, so if I make a motion, the motion would be to approve um, that the Planning Commission recommend to the Council 48, that we recommend a 48 unit project that meets city and state requirements based on the findings listed in the resolution and conditions of approval attached including the condition made by Commissioner Kennedy for a fencing option that blocks um, traffic and noise light, lights from traffic and noise. You're gonna have to help me with the other. I, I could just say as revised and as conditioned or something like that. Well, I Is wanna that be specific about the conditions that, um, Commissioner Gordon's condition um, for a traffic study and biotics report. Biotic report uh, paid for by the applicant. And ordered by the city. And ordered by the city. Are there any other conditions? I had proposed uh, just giving the neighbor the 10 grand. That's right, thank you. I knew there was one more. And Commissioner Kennedy's recommended condition that the condition for the $10,000 be given without conditions attached to that. I think that captures everything. I'm not crazy about the extra reports, but I second that motion. Okay, we have um, a motion and a second in discussion. Ms. Uh, Commissioner McKelvey. Yeah, just point of order. It, are we, is this an approval of a denial of the uh, effectively a denial of the appeal with these amendments that were that you want to vote on or is this or are we voting on the changes first that's a great question because yeah, the really appeal is not mentioned here you're right <laughs> <laughs> commissioner mckelvey yes you're right great question it I'd, seems like they should be voted on yeah uh first. Se separately yeah maybe we should take them one at a time no, that's a good point and make recommendations and, and uh, makes yeah, recommendations yeah. separately because in fact what we are voting on is to deny the appeal uh, that is the staff recommendation so. um so it's a little bit messy um and mr butler you had a comment I did. I think I'll uh, reserve that for when the uh, questions about the individual conditions come up. In particular, I wanted to talk about um, uh, the specifics of the transportation analysis and invite our transportation manager to speak to both the uh, information that's been prepared as well as getting any clarification regarding the, um, uh, the requested information. Um, uh, and then the timing, we need to talk about that as well. Um, and then uh, for, for both the biotics report and the, the traffic analysis. So those are planting seeds for when we get to that. And um, I have to say, I have concerns about the additional studies um, because I would like to hear, I'm, I'm not sure that they're needed. And I also am concerned that they're going to be an obstacle to um, the project. So. Um, I'd love to hear more about why you don't think they're needed. Um, well, um, because I think that they, that had they been needed and had they been required 
as part of the approval process, they would have been. They were. I'm asking for a, a second one. Right. Because it was ordered by the client, and this has been a very difficult process for the community, mm -hmm. and there's been a lot of community feedback that we've gotten that they were not necessarily that the community doesn't agree with, and I feel like we're here to make sure that health, safety, and the environment are addressed when these developments are coming in front of us, and I felt like it was important enough, and this has been a difficult process for the community enough to uh, to put that in motion. I mean, the traffic study, which I'm guessing is going to be addressed, was done in August, and that is when 20,000 less people are in that part of town. And so there's just a variety of things that, I mean, it's a riparian corridor for a reason, and this is going to impact that. And um, it was one person's opinion mm -hmm. in a very impactful okay. environment. Okay, I can certainly appreciate the sentiment there. I also, I am comfortable with a developer ordering um, studies and I was comfortable with them, but um, it's certainly fair to, to not be so. Uh, I, I just want to mention that there's been a lack of, I mean, there's been a breach of trust in the community right. across the board. And so this is a gesture, hoping that this makes it a little bit easier for us to get behind these projects moving forward. So it is probably a, a gesture to some degree, and I'm hoping that there's an avenue for it. So, And I really appreciate the need for the gesture, too. So, yeah. Commissioner McGalvey. Just a question for staff. Was there any concern about the validity of either the traffic report that was done or the biotic study that was done? I'll defer to our transportation manager for the traffic study. And um, with respect to um, the biotic study, what I would suggest um, for the commission, if, if uh, it does please the commission, is that rather than preparing a whole new traffic study, we have a biologist um, that we work with on a regular basis and they could peer review the analysis. And um, that would be um, uh, more time and cost efficient. Yeah, I mean, a peer re review would be fine as long as it, it's generated by the city and that the city feels like that they're behind it. I mean, that's what I'm asking for really is the community knows that we're doing due diligence because there's been a lot of complicated things about this project. So yeah, we have a biologist on, on contract through our environmental consultant that can do that work. Okay. I'll address the uh, traffic study issue. I think there might be a, piece of confusion here. The study that's prepared is what we call a trip generation memo. And that's our first step in establishing if a traffic study is in fact required. And so when we're under that 50 trip threshold that I mentioned before, we don't go into the full study. If there are particular elements of transportation analysis that you think are important, um, it sounds like to me, based on your discussion, that would be very different from what our classic traffic study guidelines are. Agreed. So um, maybe the concession on our end is that we fully, that everybody feels comfortable with how the trip, um, that, you know, how that was generated and when it was generated um, and the time of year. I mean, I know that when letters that we've heard from the community that, you know, uh, rightfully so, the community is like, really, in August we're going to do this trip, trip generation? Like, I get that. If I was a neighbor, I would I would feel like that isn't really authentic to the process. So um, if there's some way that we can validate that at a different time of year um, to evaluate that, then I think that the community would probably feel better about that. Yeah, I, I think we can actually alleviate that concern now. Um, the trip generation study is not based on um, time of year counts at the site is based on industry um, averages. And so it doesn't take, it wouldn't even contemplate whether UCSE was here or not uh, when it happened. All it is contemplating is the number of units that are proposed. And so that there is no interplay with the seasonality in that analysis. And so 
just so the community understands that the trip generation doesn't have to do with anything other than the unit count and the increase in that unit count. So the fact that the grocery store is doubling in size doesn't factor into that at all, or does it? It does, yeah. We look for the net, the net increase. And so um, the net increase on this site would be the slight increase in commercial use, and then the total increase in the residential use. And that total net change is under the 50 trip threshold. By how much? Ooh, I don't have that number off the top of my head. We can pull that. And um, just so we're clear, it's 50 p.m. peak hour trips, not daily. So that's the p.m. peak hour, just, just so we're clear. Um, give us one moment. And Matt, could you remind that. me, do, do park spaces count in that at all? <coughs> I'm thinking about like now that you don't have to do parking, does that affect the trip generation? Yes, that that's actually a really um, good observation. Our The way our trip generation studies work and sort of our impact fee program works, it's based purely on units and doesn't really take into account um, parking. And we know through research that when you provide less parking, you have less trips to a site. So that, that wouldn't be accounted for in the study. Um, the proximity to high quality transit will also reduce the amount that people would, would drive to the site. We do give a little bit of credit actually to sites on specific corridors, Mission Street is one of them. Um, where you reduce the, um, the number of trips by an established percentage um, to acknowledge that sort of multimodal use that's out there. The net project Thank trips you. were um, 29 net project trips um, based on the Hexagon Transportation Consultants Memo of August 26th, 2023. Peak hour emissions um, like 6,000 trips, is that right? Alternative project trip generation estimates. Um, let's see, because that one's calling it 12. I think this is this is with the proposed multifamily. Yeah, so 29 uh, trips. I remember that now. So let and me, oh. it, there was something there was something about this, wasn't there? Sorry, do you recall where it was actually a lower number that we were? Um, the, the, I don't know if the, I can't remember if the study off the top of my head takes into that factor for the Mission Street corridor that we have identified in the, um, the TIF resolution. I believe it's, it's around a 10% credit, I think, on, on Mission Street. That could be in addition to that number shown. Yeah, they, they do have an internal um, housing retail internal capture, which is like typical for mixed use. They've got a 15% reduction there. Um, yeah, so, so the total net is, um, is 29 yeah. PM peak hour trips. And then you're, you're, we're asking how's that compared to how Mission small Street? small that drop in the bucket? Yeah, that's like a less than a percent of traffic on Mission Street in the peak hour. So in my experience, like 20 years ago, I read my first huge traffic report. It's not going to provide the, the answers the, the neighbors. I guess we're just, you know, um, pressured to address these things with the community and because it's so hard to really get the straight answer for the community it's and and they are there is a disbelief that there aren't going to be cars and we can prioritize as owners that we're only going to rent people without cars but I don't think it's really worked 100% in other cities and so I guess I'm looking for ways as a commissioner to be like community it's going to be okay and um, you know and this is why um, and the trip generation isn't really doesn't isn't something that the community can really relate to in any tangible way and I know we've seen you up here before explaining the same exact thing so I don't even know if I really understand how that's calculated um, so it's just hard for the community to Except, so. Agreed, and um, like I said, I do appreciate that. Um, I think what we're what we're trying to do for the council is to provide some feedback on this project um, to uh, just get around this. I mean, this is this is new. This is big. It's been really hard, um, and um, I see uh, you know a lot of back and forth. I don't think that that study is going to help. Understood. I'll, I, I would settle with the peer review of the biotic. Okay. That's acceptable okay. to me. 
And me, I'm the secondary. Oh, that's think, right. I right? You mm -hmm. That's okay. Okay. So we have a motion. Um, could is it written anywhere? Could we look at it? Okay. Could you read it to us? <laughs> <laughs> you have some of it. Yeah. I'm at my head. That you uh, re make a recommendation to the city council, the approval of a 48-unit project that meets city and state laws based on findings and conditions of approval, including the fencing option that blocks light sound but not driveway visibility. Let me give you the words for that one. Thank you. The, the project shall install a <laughs> six-foot tall split face concrete block wall along the, what is that, the west property line adjacent to the neighbor? Western, Western Northwestern? Western, along Project Western. West, sorry, along the Project West uh, property line. Sounds much better. Um, that the $10,000 uh, payment be given uh, to the neighbor with the solar panels without condition and a peer review uh, that's city driven of the biotic report be conducted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you have a review? That's right. Sorry. Mm -hmm. That's what I said. Just to follow up on Commissioner McKelvey's um, comment, should we be adding deny the appeal in yeah, there anywhere? We, I was thinking I, we would do that separately. So take this motion, and then somebody could make another motion on that, and that seems cleaner to me. I, and I, I think. It, I wonder. I'd like to hear what staff says. We are not denying the appeal. It's up to the council. And it's on their agenda. Oh, I see. But you tell me what, yeah, tell sure. us how this works. This is all in a recommendation capacity, so I think it's fine for you to make that distinction, should you choose to do so, to deny the appeals, plural, and um, recommend that the council approve. Okay. Um, it's, is it acceptable to you to be denying the appeal also? You Within this motion? Mm -hmm. We're not going to do it separately? Well, you suggest we do it all at once. Either, either it's way. It's all recommendation. There's no real motion. I you have the ability to do it either way. Yeah. Um, okay, we'd have to work that into the language then. I suppose. Probably put it first. Yeah. Recommend the council. They deny the appeal. And then the rest of it with the following additions. I sure. That's good. Yeah. That's fine. Okay, and I, I, I want to go back and In I'm sorry if I'm... Uh, Okay, uh, sorry, um, uh, the developer has a comment and I'll hear it. Thank you. Um, I just want to understand, so all of these conditions will just be recommended to the, okay. That's right. If in the um, effort of transparency, I'd like an opportunity to comment on them afterwards. Also, I have a couple of comments on the public process and how this has gone and you know, Workbench yeah. has taken a lot of heat. Up to you. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. I'm. Uh, there, uh, go ahead. This, as um, the planning director stated, this is all a recommendation. So you're going to obviously, you know, this get another shot to explain all of this at the council. So right, this is also public the, record, and it feels very important to make sure it's that our stance on these conditions are known as soon as possible, and that there's a little bit of conversation about the public process. Well, that's up to the chair. Yeah, and I'm I'm willing to take it. We didn't take a rebuttal earlier, and I'm willing to take it now. Okay. Do you want me to wait until the conditions are all uh, no, mapped I out? No, I think you should do it now. Okay. So mm -hmm. I just want to express that we are also very frustrated with this process and how this has come about and how the public perception of this has happened, right? We feel from our side that, you know, we did reach out to neighbors when we felt like it was comfortable and asked to have conversations and they ended up not wanting to meet. We had lots of meetings with the city as soon as the information was given to us to try to address these, hence all of the accepted conditions of approval. Um, and, and that, you know, there's, there's sort of a, a game of telephone happening, right? The neighbors will talk to the city, they'll talk to the council members, eventually we'll get some of that information neighbors may or may not want to talk to us, council members may or may not want to talk to us. So it's been a, 
a very frustrating game of telephone where we feel like we have really tried to be as transparent as, as possible with what we're doing and give information as quickly as we can. And then the public perception of that is that we're, we're not doing that. And so it, it's a larger systematic issue with how this, how the appeal process happens, maybe how there could be some better engagement with the community earlier on in the process. The project has not changed a lot since the community meeting that we had over a year ago, but it takes the public hearing for people to be galvanized around hatred or <laughs> dislike of a project. So I just think there's, there's a bigger conversation to be having about how we fix that going forward and how, you know, how we can all be better partners to each other on that, the community, the development community, the city, everybody. Um, so, so that's just some thoughts on that. Um, and then as far as the, yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah. So, so like the neighbors, you know, I probably talked to like 600 neighbors, 500 neighbors. Can you identify neighbors, yourself, right? please, for those of us What's who that? don't know you? Can you identify yourself? I'm Doug Wallace. I'm the property owner at, at Food Bender Broom. So I get neighbors all day long, right? So like eight out of 10, go for it, do it. We love it, you know? And then there's like a few that are just, they didn't really realize it was happening until the very end. And so now they told me. Stall, stall, stall. So they just want to stall it. They just want to like push it out. And I was like, okay, well, we're trying to do the right thing. We should have met with them earlier, the, the, the really noisy people, right, that are getting to you guys. I get it. But we didn't because they were like threatening and like, you know, we're going to force you to do this and force you to do that. And so I didn't want to meet with them in that environment. Then they kind of softened it. We decided to meet. And by the time we decided to meet, they said it was too late. So it's really a handful, probably a dozen neighbors, 20 people that looked at the laws and looked at everything, but most people come in and talk and most people are okay with it. It's a few people, I get it, in the neighborhood, they've been there a long time, they're uncomfortable with it. They don't really realize that it can be incremental to the neighborhood over time. It'll be cool, it'll take a while, right, to integrate, but if you've been to cool neighborhoods, I don't know if you've been to Slab Town in Portland or any of the new developments that border um, old developments, like old neighborhoods and new neighborhoods, it works. And you bring the youthful energy in, you got the old people, it, 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 it works. So that's what we're trying to do. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I, if, is there something, um, go ahead, make, make your, if it's quick. Do you, wanna, do you want me to address conditions of approval? Um, or? We do have some additional conditions of approval, and that was actually what I thought you were going to address. So yes, okay. I would like you Sorry. to. Okay, so um, as the neighbor's solar, I think, that Doug would be very willing to do that if the neighbor would sit down and talk with him. The neighbor has refused to talk to him. So it doesn't feel like this is a two-way street when we're making concessions and offering things and it's not being well received. So there's, that's the caveat on that. I appreciate the traffic and biotic clarifications. Happy I mean, to. I did, you said Doug. No, I did talk to Doug. I talked to okay. Doug, the close neighbor, just a couple days ago and. Yeah, you know, this you know is what, yeah, this is, like, we not this is actually this? not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, not. Let's be specific here. Yep. Okay. Um, and then the the property line fence, I mean, that seems reasonable. I'd like it to be a wood, if it could be wood and or CMU, just because a CMU or concrete wall is very expensive, and I just don't want to commit to that right away. Obviously, you guys are going to make the recommendations that you're going to make. I just want to be very transparent so that when we go to city council, it's not the first time people are hearing things. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Well, like every commercial property on Mission has a concrete wall concrete block wall behind it, like almost literally, except Cafe Brazil, maybe. Okay, Matthew, did you have a, cause. Hmm? Commissioner Thompson, did you have a comment? Um, I, I guess uh, I, I'll just um, briefly mention that I, I, I'm not comfortable uh, leaving the, um, the ADUs off of the project. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't see any good reason not to include them um, and uh, I, I think that uh, this is exactly the right spot to have uh, housing for single people, and um, uh, you know it's um, it's ironic uh, to me that um, back in the '80s we were bootlegging them in, um, and uh, everybody knew that we were doing it. But it took about 10 years to get around to actually creating an ordinance to make it legal. Um, but uh, the, the, uh, there isn't any chance that we're going to build ourselves out of, uh, of a shortage of housing for small households. And um, this seems like a good spot. It's 
uh, to me, to get all we can. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have a comment? Yes. Well, I just want to say that whether whether we include it or not, they're going to be able to do it. So, just for the record, I mean that that's so it's it. It's, and, it's, and that's it's allowed. enough of a reassurance yeah. for me. Yeah. So um, it's more of a um, semantics thing, maybe because that's not what we were. We're not charged to approve a whole new project and that's ultimately what it represents to some degree so um i, I hear you but i just wanted to let every in case yeah. there was any confusion that whether we add it in or not it's 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 happening i did want to ask one more thing i realized <laughs> that about my very first comment but then we got off on all these other things is I understand that they're asking for concessions the concessions that they're asking for one being the grease trap and you know that condition be waived we're only required by law to allow them to waive three conditions they, they, we don't have to grant them the conditions that they're asking for correct we have to um so the, the concessions the, not conditions yeah, sorry concessions and sorry. incentives yeah. we are required to grant the concessions or incentives right. that are requested if they're meeting certain criteria um, they need to provide a real and actual cost um, reduction right. um, okay and, that's right understood yeah and there are some things that yeah. that are precluded they cannot ask to waive fees, for example, as a concession, which would be a cost reduction, but they can't do that. And they haven't asked for that here. Um, they have asked for deferral of fees from issuance of building permit to CFO. So what happens in an instance that we start doing more developments like this in our corridors with commercial ground floor? And how do we, I mean, obviously, that we all agreed and the staff agreed that adding that condition in for approval was a good urban planning move to uh, ameliorate a lot of the issues as architects we experience in buildings and we're trying to build for the future so how do we um address this if this is something that every developer could come in front of us and say this is a, a direct impact cost wise and how do we find ourselves planning for buildings that are going to last for many years to come and not be blighted with venting and all kinds of things that aren't planned in that infrastructure and also limit limits our ability to get tenants in there i mean really from an architect's standpoint like we have people coming to us and it's cost prohibitive to have to modify buildings significantly to do valuable projects so Thanks, thanks for that question. That's a great question. And I'll tell you, um, this is something that we as staff took seriously when, when that uh, concession incentive um, request came in. Um, we had conversations with the developer directly about that and, and um, expressed many of the comments that you just did um, and um, really encouraged them to uh, rethink that concession request for the flexibility that it could provide for the future. Um, the the response and and also expressing concerns about how that could be used in um, in really any project. Um, the response that the developer provided was that um, it's not something that they have requested on all projects, um, and that um, this being a fairly unique project, they they felt that the the food bin is going to be there for many many decades and talked about the costs associated with that now in terms of um, uh, present day value and if they wanted to retrofit at some point if the food bin was there you know 30 years down the road and then uh, wanted to transition to another use um, the upfront costs might still be uh, a, a better financial decision to do that at a later point in time your point about the the space is is really critical too because can it actually be done is is questionable because i mean from a design perspective and from a community perspective i might be okay with not doing a grease trap um and putting that infrastructure in but often what we've seen in your projects and other projects that come across is that the even the accommodation of the venting and and the infrastructure 
there's no place for those things to even go to really retrofit the building. So I guess I would ask you, again, being a responsible designer and architect, is to plan for the future and put some chases in there that this can be planned for and that, you know, grease traps can be put in and and we've seen that and they're very expensive to do, but at least we could plan for something in the future versus just negating it altogether. So I don't I don't know that I'm willing to put yet another condition on this, but I just would ask as a responsible building designer to do that. So well, can uh, I just, like, go ahead. like we recommended this and they nuked it. So we're still recommending it. They just use one of their, like, I agree with you. We talked about this a lot on the downtown plan because it's a big deal. And uh, I still feel like we recommended it. They just said it's too expensive. Goodbye. But what I'm saying is, is they can get rid of it, but they could, their workbench, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe you designed it in You're there. You could that. choose to yeah, put yeah. it. So, uh, okay, go yeah. ahead, Jamili. We're happy to to provide the chases and to, to do some of the planning. The condition is just written in a way that, it's kind of the whole shebang. And so we didn't want to be tied to the really expensive infrastructure. Pre-planning is no problem. So you're uh, creating the space for it and you're not building. Did, did I get yeah, we're not going to build anything in that is really expensive, but creating chases or planning where some of that infrastructure might go is easy enough to do in the construction document Thank phase. You. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you're good. Go ahead. I just want to add one more thing to that um, because uh, the broader conversation about um, how um, that plays out with other projects, the concessions and incentives are limited in number, right? And so developers need to pick and choose <laughs> which ones they want carefully. And, and in this case, um, that was one of their choices. Um, and it's great to hear that there's a, a willingness to, to plan and not install the costly infrastructure, but to plan so that in the future something could work. So thank you. Agreed. Okay, good. I'm very comfortable with that one. Commissioner McKelvey. Sorry. No, I was right. just going to ignore this. I, I've got to say one thing about the pre-planning for infrastructure, and that is that you decide not to do it now, 15 down the year, down years down the road, many other things have happened in the building and that chase that you built at whatever expense and whatever cost to space planning, it no longer fits or is adapt or you can't get to it, et cetera. And because, you know, no one remembers that it's there in the first place. And I just think that sometimes you have to say, you know, you, I've been through this on several projects where someone wanted to do a commercial building, uh, no intention of doing food service, office building, whatever, tenant improvement. And, uh, I, I can think of multitude of scenarios where it would be just as much of a burden to have to try to get to that old, you know, kind of predicted but badly predicted uh, solution. So um, I, I agree, but I think there's a way. Well, <laughs> well, there's always a way. It's just a matter of how much it costs and whose time and money it is. Um, okay, did you have a comment? No, I, I covered it. I just want to talk about the limited number of concessions and incentives. Okay. All right. Thank you, Thank you for that. Um, I have one further comment, and um, I have to say I have completely reversed myself. Um, I came in. I was uncomfortable with the approach of getting to 59 units using the ADUs. Um, it felt, it, you know, I, I think we're all concerned about, about, you know, perception and trust building and that kind of thing. And it kind of felt like a shell game um, before. Um, I've completely reversed myself, and I am now uncomfortable recommending a 48-unit project when we know it's going to turn out to be a 59-unit project. And um, I'm uncomfortable with the lack of transparency there. So I, I, I think that this is a 59-unit project, and I would prefer to be straightforward. And the other thing that I'm surprised about that I did not start out with in this whole you know week of reading um, I think it might be a better project. Um, um, I kind of like that there's some larger units, and um, I also like that the affordability mix has changed a bit. 
Um, so anyway, I just I, I I understand clinging to any little shred and illusion of discretion that we have. I do appreciate that. Um, Let me just spell it out then. I think that we have two choices. We can approve that 59 unit project, and we can approve a 48 unit project. Those are the choices basically. And like I have no ego about this, so um, you know I would just like to take a vote one way or the other and send it on to the council where they will do the real work here. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you very much. We have a couple of comments. First of all, Mr. Butler, you had a question? Sure, I, I'm happy to, to speak to that issue. Um, you know, technically, the, the commission is um, uh, approving a 48-unit project. I, I want to be not approving anything. We're close. recommending. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Technically, you're not approving. Um, technically, you're recommending approval of a uh, 49. Excuse me, 48 unit project, um, and those 11 ADUs are um, something, as Commissioner Gordon said, something that they will be entitled to down the line. Um, so, just to alleviate any any concerns, because I've heard that from several commissioners. Um, you know, it, it is odd, as we're all struggling with, right, because we want to have that transparency. Um, the approval on the table is for 48 units. Um, the, the concern and the reaction that I had earlier was um, thinking that um, there was a, a suggestion that that was uh, that we could prevent the, the additional ADUs, and I don't think um, that is, uh, is what's intended by the motion. Um, because it is, you know, it's state law and um, it's, it's case law that addresses the, the requirement for us to both allow for the storage and then to allow for the storage to be converted. So I, I will just put out there that uh, there is no heartache uh, or concern about the commission taking, uh, making a recommendation on the 48 units. There is the that's that's what's on the table, and there is the understanding and the attempt to be as transparent as we can with the community of saying it 15 times now throughout the hearing that we've got 11 ADUs that um, are anticipated to be converted. So the ultimate project at the building permit stage would be the the full 59 units that um, the the community has seen and anticipated, even though the approvals may, and or the recommendation in this case, may say 48. Thank you for that uh, clar clarification and uh, allowing us to uh, move towards moving on. Commissioner Kennedy. That was a good clarification. I want to bring it back to what you said, which is I don't want to approve anything more than I have to up here. And I just want to reflect that I really feel that with the seven years of just being hammered by the state. That's where I want to be. I think we're doing that by approving 48. And yeah, we're also just exactly. saying again and again. And I mean, I don't know, should we compose a quick letter to the editor and send it out? But you know, <laughs> it's I, I, the public is amazing at not absorbing information. But I agree that we need yeah. to like transmit this as much as possible. OK, we had some further comments over here. OK, we have a straightforward motion <laughs> on the floor with a second. And um, I think that we have um, discharged with this discussion our charge from the city council to um, discuss the elements of the changes and um, make a recommendation. Um, are we ready for a vote? OK, could we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Dan? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. McKelvey? Yes. Paul Hamas? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Chair Conway? Yes. Okay. Um, we did something. <laughs> Hopefully we don't see you again in a couple months. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody, for uh, staying and your efforts and um, for your work on this project. Uh, Is there oh. another motion about that? I don't think no, we really need we to because it's the nice. council that's going to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, they just asked us to talk about it, <laughs> and we did. <laughs> Good job. We talked about it a lot. All right, thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for your comments and for your efforts. Okay.
I had one like tiny thing for a future agenda. Okay, an so uh, it's well, quick, though. so first of all, we do have, and thank you all for coming. We are going to ask you to continue the conversation out in the hallway um, because we are not yet done with our meeting, but we are eager to finish. Um, so thanks again. So um, we next will. Do we do not have any subcommittee advisory body oral reports? Items referred to future agendas I don't do we have any did you have a comment here well I'm not sure where this fits the the Anton Pacific project we did a ton of work on like light you know not spilling light everywhere and it looks like they're getting pretty close to hooking up that pg &E transformer can we go for the nighttime inspection with staff like three of us sure <laughs> um, so it works. I'm I'm uh, looking over there to Samantha Hashert Samantha. Who, okay. <laughs> uh, because I believe she was the project manager on that. Um, and so I was uh, saying it looks like the Anton Pacific is getting close to their nighttime lighting inspection. Like at final, we, we condition them to have the planning staff look at night and make sure it all worked. Can some of us commissioners go? And I'll text, I'll email you tomorrow. Okay, cool. We've been talking about a tour anyway. And I was like, Seriously, for the commission, it would be fun for a couple of us to stand in front of a dark building that's brand new and say, is this working or not? Um, um, okay, can we do that um, outside of a noticed item? Uh, we'll talk more about a... When there's not a quorum, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> but if we all want to go, you just notice it. It's fine. It's a field okay. trip. We've so, done it before. So, um, okay, so it's a request. <laughs> yep. So we're, we've done it before. So. We're happy to yeah. uh, accommodate that. And also, if, if there is greater interest together, um, we, it is something we can notice. If it's separate, then you know we I'll are happy to go out and do that also. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, what we don't have on our agenda that we usually do is, is information items. Um, which I'm not sure why we do not have that on the agenda. We probably had that up front uh, because of the um, housing we element. We could have that up front. So out of order. If could it pleases the chair, we can complete it out of order. Could yes. we complete our information items? Absolutely. A um, couple of updates for you. Um, you're all aware the um, June 18th um, uh, study session in in here with the city council on the downtown plan expansion. Um, we've heard from a number of you. I think so, I can check. I thought I got a different date from Tess. Let me double check. Yeah. It was 18. Yeah. And then Bonnie was checking on attendance, I think. <coughs> I realized I was short in my email. I'm not gonna be there because it's my birthday and I'm yeah. pretty sure my wife has something planned. But if she doesn't, <laughs> I'll be here. <laughs> Oh. She's now unnoticed. That should be an easy one. <laughs> See me. I'm not going to be happy. <laughs> okay, so June 18th. So June 18th. Uh, then um, two days later, mm -hmm. we'll see you again. Um, the outdoor dining on private property will be returning um, for commission consideration. Those are uh, text changes to the zoning code. Um, Wait, I'm sorry, that was June 20th? June 20th, said? yes. So that's Thursday. That's a regular right. meeting. Um, and I, I should also note that um, we uh, do not have a meeting scheduled uh, for your, that would be June the 6th. So the, the next meeting, um, we do not currently have anything. And at this point, I think it's safe to assume we will not. We didn't want to send a cancellation. We didn't know if anything was going to be continued, but it looks like Tess may be correcting me. Uh, no, there's also um, what your regular meeting falls on the 4th of July, so I don't think we're going to be meeting on that day either. Okay. Thank you for that Thank update you. as well. Um, and, yes, we do not have anything currently uh, tracking to that date. Um, and so if, if there is a time-sensitive item, we may be reaching out about a special meeting, um, but otherwise, you know, you can anticipate that we don't have anything on the 11th uh, or um, whatever that Thursday is before that. Um, so just to be clear, so the next time we'll be convening is on the 18th? That's correct. Um, with the City Council for the Downtown Plan Expansion Study Session, we are looking to release the Downtown Plan Expansion draft document in the next couple of weeks. So by the end of the month, you should have a draft available for your review in advance of the meeting on the 18th. Um, 
And then um, one update from this week's council meeting. Uh, the Emily's Bakery Cannabis Retailer was approved by the council. So your commission approved that um, a couple of months ago. Okay. And then it was appealed to the council. The council approved it this week. And I should say Ryan did great work out there on Tuesday. I watched that whole meeting. Don't yeah. ask me why. Why do you get all the tough ones? Long meeting. <laughs> get the short straw? I, I estimated two and a half hours for that, and it, it was four and a half, so I was, okay. I was pretty far off on it. Okay. Um, okay. Is that... Um, I, just, I, don't, I don't know process-wise, but I actually just wanted to ask about the gentleman's um, recommendation about the traffic and um, parking subcommittee. And it's something that's just constantly coming up in our community as these developments continue. And, you know, when I'm having discussions about, you know, trip generation and all these things, and I guess I just, I, I, I don't know that I were prepared at 10 o'clock tonight to hammer this way, but I guess I just want to recognize that that he has a valid point he in the previous the gym conversation it came up and it's it comes up in every project and so i just wonder can we do a better job in some way of of having a subcommittee to to communicate that to you know i don't know well, so. let's have coffee we had a whole chamber a yeah planning commission outreach committee that was uh -huh. like one of the most spectacular failures I've ever seen, and that's saying a lot, so we'll talk about that sometime. Yeah, and but the I, idea and was I, to get input early, and it totally did not work. And I, I'm not suggesting that. I guess I'm suggesting is, like, if there's a core group of people that really understand yeah. all the details, that we can be an advocate for communicating that to the community in a more yeah. effective way if, or something. I don't know. But we're clearly having a breakdown yeah. in that, and there's a lot of fear around Carlos community and... Absolutely. I think it is, yeah, we, we are at a time where there's a lot of change and, you know, to the extent that uh, we have a role in the community understanding, um, you know, the changes that are coming on. I, also, I always feel very cautious about establishing subcommittees um, just because they require staff time and we don't set the agenda for the department. Um, but I think raising um, the question of how, how can this commission play a role in having the community better understand these issues? And sometimes it's with, with doing an update. Right. You know, when we, we are gonna be having some cleanup items, I believe, um, coming forward. Sometimes that can be an opportunity um, for <coughs> clarification and um, making sure that we're doing that. But do, do you have thoughts? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, those are all valid points. Um, so a couple things that come to mind, um, our active transportation plan is kicking off. And so Matt Starkey is not with us in the audience now, but um, he um, is going to be leading that effort um, with his team, and that will offer additional opportunities for outreach um, to the community about those issues. And, of course, when we're bringing um, amendments back, those are additional opportunities to discuss them. The uh, final thing um, that I would say, um, if I can remember my my final thing, because there was one other important thing. <laughs> um, um, I'll pass on the final thing because, <laughs> because it's not coming back to my to my mind right now. But um, yes, um, oh. I remember what it was. Uh, it was just a validation of your point, because um, if you notice um, in the survey that I put up from um, the 24, um, the most recent one that we did, affordable housing was top of the list, um, but um, traffic and transportation concerns was number two. So just a validation of, of both your comments and the comments that we heard from the community this evening. It, they're not isolated. They are out there. And so that's not a solution. I was thinking there was another solution, but no, it was just a validation. Yeah, I mean, just as a commissioner, I'm sure we all experience it. Everybody's asking us about, well, what about that? And I actually don't feel like I have enough education around it, and I'd love the clip notes, maybe. There you go. <laughs> because I can't go to every meeting for every commission. You sure? <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. 
Um, all right, if that's it, um, with that, this, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for your very thoughtful Thank comments. You. Does anybody want my bingo sheet? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yeah